Okay. Well, as long as everybody's well, it's the main thing. Um, so, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome members to the, the 12th meeting of the Committee for the Economy. Um, and just to highlight again that due to ongoing safeguarding measures in place um, in regards to COVID-19, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via teleconferences. Um, and witnesses will also be briefing the committee via teleconference and the minister is here this morning to brief us in person. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly website. Um, and just to remind members, if they haven't already done so, to mute their tablets with the F4 button. Um, the minister's briefing this morning is going to be hand-sorted. Um, and so just then moving on to item number one on the agenda. Um, apologies, we have apologies from, from Stuart, sure, as, as normal, Stuart is still off on well. Um, have members any other apologies to them? No, I think no, everybody's Claire, with us. Uh, Claire Suckham's on the spider thing. Okay. <laughs> the teleconference. Um, okay, so then moving on to item number two, which is our draft minutes. Um, at the, minutes the draft minutes are at page five in your pack from last week's meeting. Um, are members content that these are an accurate reflection? No. Okay, thank you. Um, then item number three, um, in chairperson's business, um, we had discussed in our uh, conversation the other day, our informal um, meeting, that we would write to the permanent secretary to ask for a status up report on departmental staffing and branch capabilities as a result of the department's work in response to COVID-19, um, including any requirement to postpone policies or strategies. So are members content that we do that? Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on then to item number four, we have the minister with us this morning to provide us an update on the impact of COVID-19. Um, minister, I'd just like to welcome you here this morning and just to advise members that we are going to, to limit it to, to one question at a time through the chair with um, no opportunity for statements this morning um, and because the briefing must end by 10.45. Oh dear. Okay, so um, there is a clerk's memo at page 12 of your pack um, and also at page 18. There is a, a departmental press release at page 29. There is a copy of the Scottish Government Framework Paper at page 36 and a slide presentation on the Welsh Economic Resilience Fund at page 63. There is also some correspondence from, from a councillor regarding Fly B at page 73. Um, there's a ministerial letter to SIA at page three of your table packs, and at 4.8 there is a table summarising departmental responses to the members' most recent um, COVID-19 related queries. So um, thank you for joining us, Minister, and for taking the time to come and, and be with us at the, the meeting this morning, um, and just like to invite you then to, to make your opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be back to see everyone, and good to see everyone well and in good health, which is really the most important thing in life. Um, I suppose really it's very, very hard to overstate um, the damage that COVID-19 has done, uh, not just to individuals and families, um, but to our economy um, and uh, to wider stakeholders within that economy. Um, we are all dealing with uh, uncertainty and I'm pretty sure that no one will be left unscathed by the crisis. Right now, our economy uh, is uh, temporarily almost uh, shut down. And that um, economic pain, of course, will be um, found uh, most in um, the wages and salaries of thousands of workers across Northern Ireland. Um, to help and support our economy, um, we have been rolling out uh, the grant scheme. Um, and last week, we announced uh, the 25,000 uh, grant scheme, uh, which is aimed at tourism, leisure, hospitality and retail. To date, about 2,700 applications have been received. And last Friday, we paid the first of those uh, grants um, out to businesses. Um, we um, are working and continue to work uh, to ensure that those are paid in tranches as soon as we can verify them um, and that they are paid out. My understanding is that yesterday a number were also processed as well. So it is about getting money out as soon as we can. 
We have paid out um, over 17,000 of the 10K grant scheme. Um, and this, of course, has been expanded to include those businesses that have uh, been industrially derated. A further 1,400 payments were issued uh, yesterday for processing. So um, we are steadily working our way through uh, that scheme. We um, currently have the help and support <coughs> of uh, the Chancellor's uh, job retention scheme. And uh, that is uh, very important in um, supporting workers and businesses um, at a time when the economy is really in an unprecedented state. And it'll be interesting, um, colleagues on the committee, I think we do need to give some uh, consideration as to uh, how that uh, job retention scheme continues. Um, I, he has extended it for another month to the end of June. But um, our analysis is that there could be uh, announcements of redundancies if that were to end uh, without ending in a graduated way. So I think that um, the committee um, could aid the work of the department and the lobby of the department um, in ensuring that that scheme um, has more life in it uh, than currently. Um, and that as we start to recover our economy, that we look at how we can uh, send those messages to central government um, that uh, we, need, we will need support, continuous support for that. Um, along with the Minister for Communities, and this is something that many of you have asked me in the Chamber, um, we have now um, ensured that workers are not disadvantaged when it comes to statutory payments. So if you are furloughed and you have gone off on maternity leave, your maternity um, entitlement will be calculated on your full salary, not your furloughed salary. So that we ensure that people do not, are, are not disadvantaged by circumstances that are completely outside of their control. Um, businesses need a voice um, and we need to ensure that we are working at my, um, in my department, but also in the assembly here and right across the community that we are conveying the messages that manufacturing, tourism, construction, aviation um, and haulage are important aspects of our economy um, <coughs> and that they will need support um, as we go forward. I am pleased to say, and I can report to the committee, that we have significant engagement um, with central government. So every week um, on a Thursday at one o'clock, I will have a call uh, which will be chaired by the Chancellor, um, which will include all of the devolved regions, um, and which will also have on it uh, the Business Secretary, the Housing Secretary, the Transport Secretary, um, all of those people who are running um, huge uh, departmental policy areas uh, in Westminster, um, and they are talking and listening to uh, the voice of the local uh, governments uh, throughout the devolved regions. That has been very, very helpful because through that we have been able uh, collectively and individually in the executive um, to work uh, on um, packages uh, and support measures that are national but have particular reference to Northern Ireland. So that is um, for ferries. Um, we've been working on an airport package and um, <coughs> we are still working um, on a, a package to support the haulage industry. So all of that work continues absolutely every week. Um, and I must say, with the Department of Transport, um, my officials have been in touch with them daily and over the weekends, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get some of this work completed. So there's been an, an enormous amount of work done in relation to that. Um, we have um, the work of the Engagement Forum, which is particularly important. Um, and the list of priority sectors has been published, as has uh, the safety guidance. And I think those are very useful tools for businesses going forward. Um, at the start of the uh, shutdown period, we did have significant issues uh, in the workplace, and those have lessened um, 
very, very significantly over this period of time. And that is due to the work of uh, businesses, the um, employers, workers, the trade unions, the health and safety executive <coughs> and the public health agency. And this work was brought together by uh, the forum and uh, I commend them for stepping in and working for the public good um, at a very, very difficult time. Excuse me. <clears throat> of course, um, one of the industries hugely um, impacted beyond <clears throat> almost any other is our tourism industry. <coughs> um, it has suffered enormously. And last week, um, we announced um, a new um, steering group which will aid and guide our work in recovering the tourism industry. We have a small working group on that, um, which is chaired by John McGrill, um, and I will chair the first meeting of that next week. It may be too soon to uh, ease the restrictions, as the Health Minister has said, but we need a plan, and we need to be working on the plan, and I will be working with the representatives of industry, of the tourism industry, to ensure that we have a plan going forward um, and that we are able um, to um, input into that um, at uh, every level. Um, that uh, group will also include representatives of local council, SOLAS, because um, obviously local councils have a huge input into tourism in uh, their local area. Um, in relation to um, skills, um, Last week, I set out um, some of the um, instructions to SIA around um, qualifications. Where we can get a calculated result, we should get a calculated result. Um, and where um, they need to make um, provision for those who need a more practical assessment um, of their result. So that is a work in progress. I checked with officials just yesterday and had a long conversation with them um, and they hope that we will be bringing this to a conclusion very, very quickly after the guidance that was issued to them last week. Um, we are also <coughs> working with our local universities. Um, many of you will know, and I understand that you will hear from both universities um, in uh, the next session of the committee, many will know that our universities have stepped up to the plate enormously in supporting local students. Um, we have, um, they have cancelled um, contracts for uh, accommodation. Um, they are continuing to provide online uh, assessments and work. Um, and we as a department have ensured that that third tranche of uh, the student loan is actually going to be paid, as has uh, every other commitment that we have made to students in further education. All of our commitments to those students um, will uh, be um, continued um, in terms of their finance. But there is still um, an issue around admissions <coughs> for universities. And a few, um, well, about six weeks ago, uh, a number um, of universities um, in England uh, and Wales started to make unconditional offers on the basis that they were worried about how um, they would go forward, how um, that um, maybe losing international students, losing uh, funding of uh, sorts. So they sought to um, compensate that by uh, putting out unconditional offers uh, to students pressurising our students to make decisions that maybe would not be right for them um, at a difficult and unsettling time. Um, the, there has been a, a moratorium on that uh, activity instituted by the Universities Minister um, with um, the, the with the, the universities in agreement, um, but we need uh, to get a plan for the way forward. And we need a plan. Um, this moratorium is due to be lifted on the 4th of May. The minister is seeking a UK-wide position, but of course it is our position that we need to protect our universities and the young people um, that will go to them um, from Northern Ireland. So that is work in progress. Um, I will have a further conversation with the Universities Minister and the Universities um, later on this afternoon. 
I um, I think I will leave it there. Um, I probably haven't covered every element. Um, I do want to specifically um, come back to you and talk about recovery. Um, we are, sorry, I, I should have added, we are in the department um, bringing uh, to life um, our economic uh, advisory group. Um, and that economic advisory group existed pre um, the stalling of devolution um, under both Arlene Foster and Simon Hamilton. Um, and we are bringing that economic advisory group to life. Those people um, will um, they, they will talk to uh, you about the, the membership of that, but those people I would like to see, people who are leaders in their field, people who know how to run um, the tech sector, people, um, leaders uh, of industry in their field who can give advice um, as to how we bring uh, the economy uh, back together, but also how we plan for the future and by the end uh, of uh, the period that we have an economic strategy that will help Northern Ireland to progress, to go forward. Um, it will be about jobs, families and prosperity. So those are the two elements um, that we need to talk about. Um, and I think that uh, this committee um, could uh, uh, work with us uh, in doing that. We also... Um, We'll need uh, to talk about tourism um, and uh, once the working group uh, is set up, um, we will revert uh, to that as well. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, and I, I guess I would just offer some <coughs> questions myself Excuse as me. well. Um, obviously, the, the, the public health impact has been devastating, but the, the economic impact is um, huge as well. Um, and there has been significant funds made available to support workers and families uh, and businesses, which have been very, very welcome. Um, but I think that we would all reflect that there is more needed. Um, and I, I think also it's important that we, we make clear that we can't any of us fathom a return to austerity on the back of this as a price for the, the, um, the investment that has been made and the funds that have been made available. Obviously, there have been very many businesses and companies that have had to rely on government support or um, to get them through this period. And I think we would maybe look at how they can, in, their, in the future, pay their way um, as well. We need to tighten up some of the, the tax loopholes and things that are there. Um, and I think also the companies that have substantially benefited from this period in terms of seeing their shares and profits soar um, need to also pay their way. And I, I have, for example, proposed a windfall tax around those companies to make sure that that, that money is being directed then back into to funding our vital public services. You have highlighted the, the broader um, economic kind of recovery that we need to talk about. Um, I think obviously that's something that we all will want to, to feed into in the future. See it very much as needing to devalue the essential workers that we have seen step up to the plate um, in the in the recent weeks. Um, invest in our public services, which upholds workers' rights and obviously, very importantly, helps our businesses to recover, um, to support all of those workers and families. Um, I, I very much welcome the, the Economic Advisory Group and would welcome the opportunity to discuss that out further and, and the membership and, and representation around that. I know members will have an awful lot of questions um, about the support that has been made available. Um, I guess I would like to pick up on some of those who haven't yet been covered by the support. Um, and we last week heard from Social Enterprise NI, um, and it's one that I have discussed with you as well on a number of occasions. Um, I think it's very important that we recognise those businesses and their contribution um, and the importance of the, the work that they do and some of the, the, um, the vulnerable people that they support um, and the impact that they have on, on communities. I think it's important that we, we work out how that they are going to be able to access the, the grant schemes. Um, and I, I would just maybe ask you if you could um, give some information around that. The, the hardship scheme as well, um, and I know that that is being developed at, at the minute. If you could maybe just um, expand a wee bit on where that is going to be directed. Obviously, there are a lot of people who have missed out on the, the grants to date. Um, those who have no premises, self-employed people, um, particularly the self-employed who have been... Um, have only started their, their businesses in the past year and who are missing out from the self-employed support. Obviously, we've also heard, and you reflected this yourself, tourism and, and hospitality businesses who have been most severely impacted. Um, they were first to be impacted and are probably going to be last to be um, able to return to work. 
and obviously there are those who are above the, the 51,000 in terms of NAV that are able to access the grant scheme, but they're, they are also facing um, ongoing costs and are in dire straits um, as well. And if they're not going to be covered by the, the hardship scheme, if it's not going to be directed towards those businesses, uh, is there going to be further support that is going to be made available or directed towards those types of businesses? I'll stop there, but I have another couple of questions. Right, I'm, I'm sort of trying to follow that. Um, can I say first and foremost, um, and remind the committee that taxation is a reserved oh, matter yes, and is not a matter uh, for the committee or the Department of the Economy um, or even indeed the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, so I, I would advise you know, political parties who want to take up those uh, taxation issues uh, to do so uh, through their uh, representatives in the House of Commons. Um, the issue um, in relation to the grants, um, we, we um, started off this uh, a number of weeks ago uh, with trying to figure out how we would get money out to companies as quickly as we could. So therefore the 10K scheme followed uh, roughly uh, the schemes in the rest of the United Kingdom um, and issued uh, money and we based ours based on your eligibility for small business rates relief. That um, has been very successful. That has got a lot of money out to companies um, quite quickly. Um, and we extended that to include those very small manufacturing companies that uh, benefit from um, industrial derating. The 25K hardship scheme is slightly more difficult uh, to, to work through. Um, it is currently open uh, for applications. Um, applications came in <coughs> very significantly in the first few days, but we now have 2,700 applications uh, for those. And that is for businesses with a rateable value up to 51,000. So obviously, as you say, there are a number of people who simply don't fit into any of those categories and businesses uh, who fall through the cracks. Um, and I think that one of the things that we can do and should be doing, and this is my opinion, um, it's not the opinion of the executive as yet, it's something that uh, is being discussed, but it is my opinion. Um, <clears throat> that one of the things that we can do that will help some of these companies very significantly is extend uh, the period of rate relief. Um, in Northern Ireland, we um, it gave uh, three months rate relief, but we did it slightly differently to the rest of the United Kingdom in that we applied it to everyone. So all businesses got um, the rate relief. That means that in Northern Ireland, 60% of the businesses that received that would not have received that rate relief had they been in England, Scotland or Wales. So there was a significant um, level uh, of work done to ensure that all businesses got an immediate boost of the three months rate relief. Um, however, I'm, when I look at how we can support businesses efficiently and directly, it is my view um, that that can be done uh, through further uh, rate relief. And I do know that um, the Finance Minister is working with Ulster University um, to look at a scheme um, whereby we could uh, consider how we could target further business rate relief. If you are um, above uh, 51,000 uh, NAV, um, then there isn't anything that has been particularly directed at you. And yet these are, in terms of tourism, some of our most valuable assets and they will need support to get through this particular period. So that is, that is my own personal view. That is the view I've been putting forward to colleagues. Um, and I think that that is, is one of the areas that we can help with most. You're quite right, um, and colleagues will know that I have a weekly call with the chair of the committee. Um, to discuss issues uh, pertinent to the committee. Um, and we have discussed at length uh, a further hardship scheme. That hardship scheme um, we are currently drafting um, and I hope will come out the other end um, very, very shortly. Um, and uh, we are looking at small and micro businesses. So if you're in the tourism sector um, and you're a small B&B, there is nothing that, because you, you're not paying um, uh, into any of, uh, or you don't qualify for any of the particular rate schemes, there's nothing in particular for you. So it will be targeted at small and micro businesses. And we hope uh, to get that 
uh, through the system very, very quickly now. It's in its final stages. Um, can I also, and I think it's worth putting on record to this committee, um, say a public word of thanks um, to my officials who have worked extremely hard in difficult and disruptive circumstances to try to get uh, this through. And indeed, uh, all departments have experienced this uh, to, to a, a very large degree. But it's probably more evident since we've been doing the, the grant work. So that small hardship scheme will come out um, very soon. Um, we are still continuing to talk to the Minister for Finance, the Minister for Communities, um, and of course uh, with my officials um, about uh, how we direct help at social enterprise. It was my understanding that there was a significant amount of money that had come uh, via Barnet Consequentials um, for um, charities uh, and uh, this particular sector. So there will be a conversation this week as to how that is done. Make uh, no mistake about it, um, social enterprise is an important part of our economy. These are businesses who reinvest their profits in uh, local communities and in doing and supporting um, uh, different kinds of, of projects. They're an important, valuable and vibrant part of our economy that we need to support. Um, have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. Um, just to come back then on the, the social enterprises, I guess the, the point I would make is some, some of these are, are businesses and should very much, in my view, be able to access the grant schemes that have been made available. And if there is something that needs to be worked out around um, how their NAV can be used to, to direct that support, then I think that that's something that, that officials need to, to work out. I know that Social Enterprise have put forward proposals about how that could potentially be done, and, and I would just urge that, that that is taken on board, um, aside from the work that is being done around the charity specifically. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of other points just before I pass on to, to members. Um, obviously, another one of the things we've discussed at length is support for students, and it was highlighted again in the, the private tenancy bill yesterday around the, the need to um, put in place some hardship support. And I think that is just something that we as a committee um, and myself would, would, like, would like to see happen. Um, and, and then just yesterday evening, the, the RHI consultation was um, published. Um, and the the um, the tariff review and I, I guess um, obviously there's the other um, report that has been made available in terms of um, well it was called it was called the hardship report the blue, blue gas blue glass report um, and in as part of NDNA there was uh, the the commitment to close the RHI scheme and I was just maybe ask about how those things are going to be taken forward and how, you know if potentially it would have been um, an idea to have done the, the tariff review along with the, with the other items in terms of the, the potential to close and how that would be managed. Okay, um, in relation to support for students, as uh, we discussed on a number of occasions, um, I have already done a paper to the executive um, and to the Department for Finance asking uh, for specific support for students. And we already have a mechanism through the universities which have a very well developed system um, for supporting students who find themselves in financial difficulties or students who for one reason or other find it difficult to access um, higher education. We have already put that uh, proposal um, and a bid in for money uh, for that uh, which would really see the doubling of the hardship fund for students that they currently have. Um, so um, that is with uh, the Department <coughs> of Finance, with um, the executive, and uh, my understanding is that there will be a conversation around allocations reasonably soon. I would urge colleagues to support that, um, because I think that um, that is uh, worthy of something that we must continue to do. Um, it's not me. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, that, that is already in the system. In terms of the RHI consultation, um, two things really I want to say about it. I don't want to preempt the consultation. I said that I would conduct this business on behalf of the executive in a manner uh, that is transparent and open and publish what I have. I have done that. Um, and uh, I've also said, and it will be a guiding principle as we take this particular issue forward, that we need to be fair to those who engaged in the scheme in good faith 
and we need to be fair to taxpayers who are funding the scheme. And those will be the guiding principles, openness, transparency and fairness to the people uh, involved uh, as we deal uh, with this uh, particular issue. So I had uh, two reports um, that came to me um, that arose out of the Westminster uh, Select Committee consideration of the issue last year. Um, so the Cornwall report is the report on the tariff review. That recommends an uplift of the tariff review and uh, everybody has a copy of uh, the, that or you can get it on, uh, online very easily. Um, that recommends an uplift of the tariff review but I have also published uh, the uh, report uh, conducted by Andrew Buglas into the hardship caused uh, by the scheme. Um, and that is in, uh, to keep my promise to be open and transparent and make sure the information is in the public domain. I um, decided to go ahead with the tariff review because work is still undergoing uh, to decide options around um, whether uh, this how the, and how the scheme could close uh, in response to the NDNA commitments. That work um, is complex. It takes into account a number of very significant legal uh, issues um, and is not likely to conclude um, for a period of time. I therefore thought it would be unfair to participants in the scheme if we were not to go ahead then with a tariff review and an uplift in a tariff review that um, had been um, evidenced to me by uh, an independent report. So it is now out for consultation. I welcome all views on uh, that particular issue um, and we will um, formalise uh, the responses to the consultation uh, as soon as the period is closed. But that's my rationale for doing it. Um, and that is um, where we are. I hope to bring, um, and I will alert the executive uh, to this very shortly, um, a number of options papers to the executive in the near future as well. But while we're doing that, I think it is unfair if we have independent evidence uh, on this particular issue and don't act on it. So that's my reasoning for it. Thank you. And just in a quick follow-up in relation to perhaps the time frame around... Um, bringing forward all of those proposals? The consultation is out for four weeks. Um, it will then go to the, it will be obviously reported on. It will go to the executive for an executive view because obviously this is something that the executive will decide upon. It is contentious and cross cutting. Um, so therefore, it will be for the executive to take a view. Um, and then, um, in order to, if the view is to uplift the tariff, that will require primary legislation. So that's the, 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 the time frame for that. Um, I would hope actually mid-May to bring some papers to the executive around other options, but they will be outlines um, and they will take into account the legal complexities around the issue as well. Thank you. Um, Claire, can you hear us? Could be a time lag. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Good morning, uh, Minister. Good morning. Um, I, I suppose it, it's really just to acknowledge some of the comments that the chair has made in relation to further supports. Um, very slowly, I'm getting uh, messages from constituents who are very grateful for the initial uh, small business rate relief uh, scheme, the 10K, but are finding that this money is, is moving very quickly and they, they will acknowledge that they will need further support, particularly from those areas that um, are unlikely to be opened as soon as maybe other uh, businesses after the lockdown. And I do support your personal call for an extension of uh, rates relief, hopefully up to a year. And I hope other uh, colleagues within the executive will do that also. I, I suppose really my question is around um, uh, do you anticipate any further support in, in relation to those businesses who are finding that the 10K isn't stretching where it needs to and able to save their business? And, it was, and also a question in relation to the hardship fund. Do you acknowledge that it was just for small businesses, whereas I have a concern that quite large businesses are ineligible for uh, some of the schemes and really will fold if, if there's no support coming soon? Um, I agree with uh, you, Claire. Good morning. I hope you're keeping well. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to businesses this morning from the, your constituency um, on some of these issues. Um, okay. as, um, 
as I was uh, starting my day off. Um, and we discussed a number of issues and one for businesses going forward, um, how they come out of this period, how they come into recovery. Now, all of these businesses are people who have families and loved ones who are impacted um, by uh, COVID-19 just as much as everybody else. Um, and they are conscious that this is first and foremost a health issue and that we must be really careful to ensure that whatever we do <coughs> does not uh, impact um, or cause further spikes uh, in the number of deaths um, and uh, the health issues that we've uh, encountered. So they, they are acutely aware of that. Um, some of these businesses are asking around further supports, um, but um, one of them made a, the very, very clear point, and I think this is really important, um, that as we come out um, of a furloughing period, as we try to recover the economy step by small step by small step, um, that the supports that are in place nationally, which are absolutely massive and crucial to businesses, um, are not stopped abruptly. And that's one of the issues that everybody recognised as being very important. Um, I think that uh, the other uh, national um, scheme that was announced this week, which I think is significant for many of our small businesses here, is the small uh, loan scheme for SMEs uh, up to 50,000 and 100% uh, uh, guaranteed for a year by the government. That will be a significant um, help uh, to small businesses and SMEs in Northern Ireland, who are, after all, the absolute backbone of our economy. The hardship fund is what it says, a hardship fund um, for small uh, and micro businesses. Some of those businesses are finding it very, very difficult. They have not been able to access any support uh, whatsoever. Um, the rates issue is not applicable to them, um, and we need uh, to get that out uh, as quickly as possible. And as I said before, I think one of the major areas where we can offer support for businesses is extending uh, the rates relief. And I think that those are all important. We then need to discuss how locally we can um, produce um, recovery measures. And that is where um, I'm looking uh, to um, the strategic recovery uh, group uh, to recommend sectoral um, supports that we will need as we go forward. Thank you, Minister. Appreciate it. And Gary? Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Minister, for uh, coming along today. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about um, recovery, and I think it's important that we do talk about that at this stage, given the fact that um, uh, many sectors are starting to uh, look to reopen. Uh, some are already reopening. I think that we need to uh, support those businesses in doing so, um, uh, and not allowing them to be to be demonised as long as they're adhering to the safety guidelines which uh, were published. Uh, to, go, to go on a slightly different track, you mentioned within your um, introduction around uh, airports and packages, and certainly within my own constituency in London Derry, the airport uh, is key in terms of the uh, tourism industry, but also in terms of businesses. Uh, do you? Um, uh, well, I'm assuming you do know, but uh, when can we expect such a package? Given the fact that uh, airports are struggling, there's hundreds of jobs on the line, uh, and we need to see, as I say, those routes uh, saved and protected as well. Thank you. Um, very valuable question um, and one that our department, um, along with other departments um, in the executive, have been doing a lot of work on. First of all, a, a, a bit of a word on connectivity. Um, we um, have suffered greatly in Northern Ireland um, through this pandemic uh, because of the loss of connectivity to our main market in GB. Um, and uh, that has been very, very regrettable. I often say, and sometimes I need to also remind myself of it, that at the beginning of March, I was sitting in New York with representatives from airlines talking about further direct flights to Northern Ireland. Folks, that is only a few weeks ago, and it feels as if everything has changed utterly in that very short period of time. Um, so... Connectivity, whether it's connectivity um, further or connectivity with, uh, in the United Kingdom, is massively important. It's our biggest market, um, and we need to maintain that. So, um, 
For um, airlines, this has been really, really difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and for example, Belfast City Airport now has one direct flight to Heathrow per day. Uh, Belfast International Airport has no uh, direct uh, flights and, and, and that has ceased. But it is operating its freight uh, division uh, and working to ensure that crucial supplies are brought into Na- Northern Ireland efficiently um, from uh, GB. And we do thank them for continuing uh, that operation. City of Derry Airport um, has also uh, suffered uh, hugely through this, but we continue and will continue, I can tell you that, um, to support the PSO route um, at uh, City of Derry. We have been working with the Department of Transport um, on the issue. Um, There has been significant work done on this, um, and I hope that there will be um, an announcement around these issues fairly soon. Um, John? Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Thank you, Minister, for your presentation. Hopefully, in the near future, we'll be able to get you for a wee bit longer. But can I return to the Student Hardship Fund? Uh, I note from your comments to the Chair that you are or you have presented a paper to the executive uh, for discussion and, and hopefully support. But has your department identified any savings to add to the pot for the Student Hardship Fund? Yep, thank you uh, for the question. Yes, I have uh, prepared a paper that has gone um, to the executive. If that paper is to be adopted by the executive, um, that um, will uh, ensure that there is significant extra funds for student hardship. Although, if there are students listening at the moment, that third semester fund for student hardship is live, is available, and students can uh, avail of it uh, as we speak. Um, my department um, has put the paper up to the executive and will continue to make that case at the executive that this is worthy of support. In our department, we have already identified savings to uh, support um, and redirected funding to support those uh, students who are doing PhDs um, and who are doing further research. So there has been significant uh, money allocated uh, for them, and we would ask for executive support for the wider Student Hardship Fund. Um, Sinead. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister, for that summary of, of, of the various schemes. Uh, one of the schemes that I'm um, particularly uh, concerned about, and it hasn't been released yet, is the self-employment support scheme. There's a lot of anomalies already identified within it, and it's my fear that those that are last in the list of getting support are going to fall well short of it. Um, I mean, it doesn't really reflect some of the kind of self-employed uh, situations that are that occur here in Northern Ireland. For example, people can be in PAYE but also be self-employed. Um, people are, um, you know. Uh, Getting dividends uh, and uh, and are, are investing their profits back into the company. It doesn't take any recognition of that. So, you know, my my concern is a lot of people that are at the end of this this uh, process of support are going to be very badly affected. And I would just like you to give that consideration and perhaps maybe try and fix it before it goes live. Uh, and that's happening throughout uh, the whole of the UK. These difficulties will come face to face. So that that's that. And what I, what I'm uh, welcome to uh, that others have said is that we you know we have to look to the future. We have to look at how we um, we've responded to to businesses that are in financial difficulties. But we have to look at how we renew uh, and how we move forward and recover from this. Uh, and one of the aspects that uh, is uh, vexing me at the minute uh, and I'm vexing most of the people uh, in the city that I come from is uh, about getting signed off for the medical school. And uh, we need that sign off done within the next 30 days or else we will lose the opportunity. Um, the General Medical Council um, needs uh, a sign off for us to proceed. And we also need to uh, ensure that uh, the three departments that are involved in this, which is the Department of Finance, the Department of Health and uh, the Department for the Economy, um, sign that off in in unison. Uh, And it's really important. Now, um, I I just want to to see, because there is a 
a situation here where the Department of Health has got the business case, but once they send, sign it off, it'll be like the medical school in Queen's. It will be your department that will be mm -hmm. leading on it. Uh, and I just want to find out from you what your um, what your thoughts are on that. And then a final um, a question is, um, has your department done any modelling in, re in relation to the impact of COVID-19 on the economy? And have you put on top of that uh, the modelling what Brexit uh, coming along, if there's a no deal, or if there is a hard border down um, the IRC, what those two crises meeting, when they combine together, what that will further do for the economy? And are you uh, consulting maybe with external experts in order to kind of uh, find like that? Because we, as a, as a committee, need to know what the next crisis is and how soon are we going to meet it? And has your department got the capacity and the capability to deal, deal with two major economic crises at the same time. Okay, that's it really. That's a lot, Sinead. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's go. Um, so yes, um, the self-employed fund obviously is a national scheme. Um, and as with all of these schemes that are thought about and enacted very quickly, um, the policy development behind it um, really shows up, or the limited policy development behind it, really then, once you delve into it, starts to show up the flaws within the scheme. Um, and I have been passing uh, information uh, back to London around uh, small limited companies um, and around uh, some of the issues and the length of time that it's taking to get that scheme for the self-employed out uh, and into the process. Um, but it is a national scheme and, and we continue to work um, with the, the, the departments in London, the Department um, for um, <coughs> Business. Um, and uh, my call at 11 o'clock is with uh, Minister Sahawi from that department. Um, and uh, those are the issues that we continue to raise with them. Um, okay. And they are important and they're very impactful on people's lives. I understand that. Um, your question uh, around city deals uh, and McGee maybe um, leads me to be able to um, give you a little bit uh, of update uh, on the, the city deals. So <coughs> the four uh, city stroke growth deals um, are um, in various stages of development. So the, there's no one of them um, at, at, at the same uh, space. So the Belfast region deal, uh, the heads of terms for it were signed on the 19th of March, um, and it's now in a business case development phase, um, and that will continue uh, for some time. We have some, seen some um, outline uh, business cases, but there is nothing that will be developed to full business case uh, for a particular uh, period of time. Um, the city deal for the North West um, is uh, currently still being worked on, um, and uh, we would hope that there will be heads of terms uh, signed for that, um, perhaps May, June times this year. So um, there is uh, significant work um, going on around the city deal for the North West, um, and uh, we continue to work on that. Um, the Mid South West, which is Mid Ulster, Fermanagh, my area, Upper Ban, um, the growth deal uh, there, um, we, uh, they launched uh, a new regional strategy um, and some projects are being developed, but it is in its very early stages. Um, it's uh, a very interesting one. They've done a lot of work where um, some of the stuff has come organically from uh, local communities, so it's, it's a very interesting um, one. The Causeway Coast and Glens deal, um, it is still... Um, has had limited progress, um, but we will continue to work uh, with the council <coughs> there to make sure that that is uh, progressed. So that's they're all in various stages of development, um, and that's where we are. In terms of city deals generally, um, one of the things that we really must uh, ensure um, that one, the projects that come forward are financially sustainable. Um, and that those projects reflect some regional balance so that we don't get similar projects in innovation in every part of Northern Ireland, that we have some regional balance. Um, so those, those are uh, very uh, important and they must represent value for money uh, and be sustainable as of themselves. <clears throat> so that's where we are generally with city deals. Can I say 
that I, as the Minister, am absolutely committed to City Deals. I think that they will be an important regeneration and recovery tool as we go forward. And there are important elements of those deals for our economy in innovation um, and tourism um, and uh, di the digital economy. Those are the ones that I have responsibility for that will be particularly impactful on local communities and will help us and, and we need to incorporate them into our long-term economic strategy. So that's where we are on a general basis with City Deals. In terms uh, of McGee, um, we continue uh, to support um, the McGee um, in every way that we can. Um, the Department of Health is the department that has respons workforce responsibility and policy responsibility for bringing forward um, the specifics uh, around uh, McGee and uh, either for, for, particularly for the medical school. They do this for Queen's University and their uh, medical school, so they have the policy responsibility uh, for doing that. We will then pick that up um, once those issues um, are um, dealt with and once uh, funding has been identified for it. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry, no, sorry, because John Stewart needs in. Oh, and sorry, I didn't in. get the Brexit uh, question answered. And I'm sorry, I really sorry. didn't get that question answered as well. And this is time finite in relation to the I medical just, school. Just, just, just be sick. Um, the minister needs to be away for 11, and we do have a couple of other members to get questions so, in, so we can do Can I just quickly. say very, very quickly, in terms yeah. of, there's lots of Brexit issues going around. It hasn't gone away. Mm -hmm. um, COVID-19 <coughs> hasn't chased it off the scene. Lots of issues are going around, and tomorrow will be one of the meetings of the specialised committee um, on uh, these issues. Um, so plenty of work still going on on Brexit in the department. Um, and of course, um, what happens uh, with Brexit um, is also up to our national government and the um, strategic decisions that they uh, take in relation to that. We will continue to work in the best interests of Northern Ireland making sure that Northern Ireland's interests are represented at, at all areas. And I know uh, that the First Minister, and I think perhaps the Deputy First Minister, had a call with Michael Gove recently, um, and uh, that we continue on that work. But those are strategic decisions, and the impact of those decisions will be strategic decisions for the national government, with input from Northern Ireland. Thank you, and uh, we will hopefully get the minister back for for further questions in in the very near date in the oh, future. I mean, I have a list as long as my arm, and they they actually need answers very very quickly. Exactly. And maybe there should be a, a dedicated helpline that we can go uh, as as elected representatives to ask these questions and get answers quickly, because this is not satisfactory in any shape, form, or fashion. As um, scrutiny. Uh, can, can I just respond so. to that? I weekly um, hold a weekly um, call with the Minister, or with the Chair of this, um, where any issue, there is nothing off the table. Everything that wants to be discussed is discussed. And I think the Chair will accept and acknowledge that. Um, these are open and transparent discussions. And anything that the Committee wants to raise, I am happy to hear through the Chair in those discussions or come back to the Committee and discuss those with it. Okay. John. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know time is precious, so I'll try to be brief, Minister. I um, just want to echo some of your points that you made, especially around social enterprises. I think there'll be a great deal of frustration among that sector today that there wasn't an announcement that would cover them. Um, they have been excluded from all support to date, and they're, they're really looking towards the, the, the Welsh Economic Resilience Fund that you know, I raised with you previously in the Chamber, Minister, that did offer grants and support to social enterprises as well as a wide range of businesses, both big and small, and it would be great if we could have heard something more like that today. Uh, I am encouraged about the um, the the um, aspect around um, support for businesses that are missing out. Um, it does concern me around how we assess or how subjective the term of assessment hardship can be, how one person can assess that. And I would be interested to see the criteria around that and if there will be an appeal mechanism for businesses that maybe don't get it on the first application. Um, one of the aspects, one of the um, sectors that have missed out though on all this, as you'll be aware, are sports clubs. And there is a great deal of fear among football, cricket, rugby, hockey, GAA, the list goes on, that they have slipped through the net massively. They don't qualify, many of them, for small business rate relief because they qualify for small and recreational relief, and many aren't big enough to qualify for the 25K. 
they are likely to be the last sector to come back because Dominic Rabb said, as you'll probably have remembered last week, that recreational sport is unlikely to return this year. So these are a sector that are massive employers that have huge benefits socially um, in terms of mental health in the local area, but are getting nothing and could well collapse. Is there anything that can be done to prop that up? And I would be interested to hear, as I say, about the other support mechanisms, especially for social enterprise. Thanks, Minister. Well, I, I have covered the social enterprise, um, so I'm not going to go back on, on social enterprise okay, again. Um, the issue uh, around sports clubs is very important. Many of those we fought very, very hard uh, to get leisure included in the 25k grant, and that will have benefited a significant number uh, of sports clubs uh, from whatever particular variety they are. So that will have had significant benefit to those sports clubs. The, uh, whether or not there is an extension of the 10K scheme to include those who benefit from uh, that particular uh, aspect of uh, relief um, will be uh, at an executive decision as to the finances that are uh, available at that particular time. I recognise um, and I work with a number um, of very valuable sports clubs, They're not just um, our sporting clubs, but who are absolutely integrated into their community and who are part and parcel of that community. And I recognise the value of those clubs. We will uh, and do intend, uh, once we get uh, further down the line, um, in recognising how much of the allocation is going to be used in both the 10 and the 25K. And we will do a kind of a, a mop-up um, exercise um, to see um, what uh, sectors have missed out uh, and where we need to go next. But we're just a little bit off that one at this particular time. Thank you, Minister. Gordon, if you have time. Yeah, thanks, Minister. Chair. Thanks, Minister, for all your efforts. Just endorse what jo uh, John has said about the uh, sports clubs and leisure providers are in there as well, the family entertainment centres and so on. So on. They have a lot of staff employed. Football clubs, golf clubs, we've talked about before, but golf clubs, about 50 of them 50% of them at the moment do qualify, the other 50 don't. I would argue a bit like what he has said. Um, we got them involved into the 25k, but I believe the criteria is not right for that. I don't believe that scheme was designed, and it wasn't initially designed for leisure, and the leisure were brought in, and it does, it does not fit, and I think we need to look at the criteria on that, in re specifically regarding uh, sports clubs and such activities. The one other point, and I'll be brief, is we welcome the, the fact that um, the industrial derating was brought in for under the, t the 10K grant, but I would like to argue that we may need to move that up to the 25K for small manufacturing businesses. A lot of NAV at the minute, they, don't, they just they don't fit, and uh, a lot of them are missing out, and I think we need to look seriously at that and try and include more of those businesses that are in the, the, you know, the real world, they're manufacturing, engineering, they're in printing, and so on. And to, to date, they're getting little or no support. So I would, would appreciate a review of that criteria in relation to the 25K grant. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to very, very quickly, because I, I, I don't want to miss the call, yeah. um, very, very quickly, uh, in terms of uh, leisure, um, and its inclusion in the 25k. Um, that was um, hard fought and won uh, by my department to ensure that they were within the 25k. Many of the clubs that you specifically talk about, Gordon, are not in the 25k scheme because their rateable value is beyond the scope of the 25k scheme. Um, so therefore, um, you know, I go back to my original point that actually rates relief is one of the biggest ways that we can impact on those areas very, very quickly. Um, and, and that uh, is, is very important. Um, in terms of small manufacturing businesses that perhaps uh, fit within 15 and 51, um, there is, of course, an argument to uh, include um, everybody in this. I'd go back again and say that when the finance minister announced uh, his rate relief package, uh, those businesses were included with that rate relief, whereas in England, Scotland and Wales, they were not included with that rate relief. So manufacturing got that 
um, initially. Is it enough? Um, probably not, and probably there is more to be done. Um, and I would have some sympathy um, with the cause, but all of this, all of this, will come down to the finance that is available um, and the uh, decisions that are taken around that finance. We are, and I keep saying this, and, and it is worth saying it again, we are in unprecedented um, times, times when um, things have happened and the economy um, has had to react in a way that we will never have seen before, um, not even in great uh, times of great national distress before. All countries are suffering huge um, impacts on their economy. Um, we need um, to take the right steps to recover the economy when the time is right and when the situation in respect of the virus and our health uh, decisions um, are right. Um, I will look forward to working with you to ensure that we do that um, and uh, that we um, continue uh, to work um, to, to make sure that businesses uh, flourish in Northern Ireland and that we are focused on jobs and families because that's what's important. Yeah. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Thank Chair. Thank you very much for, for your Thank time. You. Sorry. And I would just very also happy. like to put on record the, the committees. Um, thanks to the de departmental officials that have been working behind the scenes on all of the various schemes that have been going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I, will, I will write to the Minister with the <coughs> one question that I wanted to ask, but thanks to the members who had to ask five or six and delivered speeches. <laughs> Zoomed up all of the time. Thanks for that. We will be asking the Minister to come back soon as well. Um, you can ask the first question that day, Christopher. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Stay safe. Anyway. So we're moving on then on the to our um, briefing from the Federation of Small Businesses, and I believe Roger's already on, on the line. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, members will be able to refer to a note at page 75 of the pack, um, and there is a response to um, the NIFR's committee on custom arrangements from FFB on page 79 of your pack. Um, Roger, if you want to go ahead and, and make your opening statement, and then members will be invited to ask questions. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good morning, and thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, as you know, we did send you a briefing paper on the 30th of March outlining key issues. And as we noted in that paper, FSB is the largest business organisation in Northern Ireland with around 6,000 members covering every location and every sector across the region. And in the main, it's the business owner who joins FSB. However, we also have a significant number of social enterprises in our membership where the person in a controlling position becomes the member so that they can access the same advisory services and indemnity as business owners. By way of example of these, uh, FSB advisory services have responded rapidly to support members on issues such as the, the process of how to furlough staff, how to select people for furlough without discrimination, both to go on to it and to come off it, and a raft of other unfamiliar regulatory and policy areas. The current situation has impacted on every single section of society and the economy, so the breadth of our membership has let us get a considerable intelligence on the effects that this has caused. For example, I've mentioned the importance of social enterprise in Northern Ireland, and I know you had a very useful conversation with Colin Jess last week, where he set out the issues affecting the sector, many of which are FSB members. We've real concerns about those enterprises which have been so dramatically impacted because of restrictions imposed on them by government, yet for which no significant assistance has been forthcoming. And there's a, br a bitter irony, really, that those that have moved away from public funding to develop independent trading revenues now find themselves overlooked by the funders precisely because they've moved out of the public funding orbit. And that can't be right. But looking more widely across our membership, there are many high-profile sectors with which, uh, whose issues you're, you're familiar with, so the retail, hospitality and tourism, services and manufacturing sectors, where FSB has several thousand members in Northern Ireland. But there are many others which have been severely impacted, but whose plight hasn't been so easily recognised. For example, there's a wide range of health providers, from physiotherapists whose vital role in the health of the population has been stopped in its tracks, with devastating consequences, to podiatrists and dentists and optometrists and many more. All of those professions where close contact with the customer has been required 
uh, has required a cessation of activity that has seen the business crash to a halt, often with no government assistance available to support them in this time of immense need. Many of these professionals are members of FSB, and we've heard some harrowing stories of the impact on lives and livelihoods. And there are other service providers which overlap with the high street retail presence, such as hairdressers and health and beauty providers and vets and other professions. I mentioned tourism. We're all familiar with the high-profile players in the sector, but many of the smallest operators, all of whom have played a part in ensuring that Northern Ireland has the depth of provision to allow us to bid for some stage events, Euro or the Open or the tall ships are largely invisible in the current situation because they do not pay non-domestic rates. I was speaking with a member only this week who operates two tourism businesses. He has a first-class, uh, highly successful self-catering business here and an online-based yacht chartering business in the Adriatic, which makes most of its profits overseas and repatriates them to Northern Ireland. Yet neither of these businesses are eligible for any of the government assistance that's been introduced to date. And in the case of the charter business, this is a perfect example of the sort of digital exporting tourism business that the executive has been encouraging and championing for a number of years. And yet it's a significant risk of collapse because there are no available supports. We've taken literally hundreds of calls from members in all of these sectors and more with a catalogue of dramatic stories being um, about the damage that's happening to their businesses, often because of being overlooked because of all the supports that have been put in place for others. So we're trying to look at need uh, and some of the examples we've seen where there is need that haven't yet been responded to will be businesses that share premises with others, such as the members who called us because one has a hairdressing business and is the rate payer, so has received one of the small grants, but the other in the same premises runs a manicure and beauty business, uh, but has had to close and has received nothing. Or the businesses who work from home, but not at home, um, such as the kitchen designer who works in other people's um, properties, either um, new builds or refurbishments or the builder who employs 25 people but has no registered business premises because his team are always on the construction site, or the van-based businesses, of which we have a large number in the membership, electricians, plumbers, joiners, carpet fitters, and the like. So I suppose in summary, we, we commend governments both here and at Westminster for responding in an extraordinary way to an unprecedented situation. But although we've seen a range of interventions, we must continue to identify need and close the gaps. So for example, each unit within multiple retail premises under the same ownership still have very similar needs in each business. The ownership shouldn't really be a factor to decide whether there is need or not. But as well as need, we have to have speed. So, For example, in childcare, we know that assistance is coming, and that really is very welcome. But if the need has been established and the resources committed, it's vital that we then act with speed to get it delivered. Now, we have written to both Minister Dobbs and Minister Murphy to urge additional resources be deployed to ensure that the systems are speeded up. And we also are seeking transparency in the, prog in the progress for those businesses that are going to get assistance, get it quickly. Uh, and so we're also calling for daily updates so that we can uh, have advice on progress uh, on how the department is getting through the task. We've also asked that the imminent closing dates that are uh, being applied to schemes um, be extended significantly as they are in Scotland. There seems little point in accepting that there is a need and then putting in place an arbitrary cut-off period to rule people out. So to summarise, I would say we've, we have to identify need to fill the gaps and support those who've slipped through the nets. I was encouraged to hear the Minister recognising this earlier when she mentioned the micros in the tourism sector, but we also have to act with speed. Scotland and Wales have already moved quickly. But even if not distributed, the transparency means that businesses know what funding is coming towards them. We need to ensure that officials have the resources that they need to do the job and to do it quickly. Thank you. And just to pick up on that final point, we, we have asked um, for, or we have agreed this morning to, to write to the department and just to ask for some clarity around um, the, the resources and, and where they're being directed at the minute. Um, so hopefully that will help around some of those issues. Um, and obviously, um, well, a lot of what you're saying is very familiar to members um, because obviously we're all talking to, to businesses in our own constituencies and, and further afield. And many of the the, um, the gaps that you have highlighted, we have also raised with the department. But um, we will reflect all of the issues that you have highlighted this morning back to the department officials as well. Um, I, I guess you, you have kind of covered a lot of what I, I might have been asking. Um, 
I, I guess in terms of you have picked up on the, the social enterprise and obviously that is something that, that we do want to see movement on. Um, some of those businesses that you have highlighted in terms of, you know, particularly the likes of your podiatrists and physiotherapists and, and those other ones we, we have received. Um, I know I personally have received letters this week around that and we'll be picking that up with the department as well. Um, because obviously those are, you know, it's not quite possible for, for those businesses and probably for quite some time to be able to, to function as normal. Um, so I'm going to open it up to, to members. Um, John Stewart, you're... Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Roger. Thank you for your presentation. Good morning, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you covered a lot of the bases that, as the Chair says, we're getting um, inundated by local businesses on a daily basis. Um, one of the aspects um, are the variability of the, of the situations that businesses find themselves in, whether that be the split sites that you referred to or renting off landlords um, or paying the rates directly to landlords, so not initially being eligible for those grants. Um, there is some news that that's coming down the line, but we're still waiting to see those application processes open. Um, we heard from the Minister today, though, that there's um, what appears to be a very thorough rollout so far of those who are entitled to the grants, particularly within your sector, um, all these good news stories. But I can't seem to square the circle. Maybe you can for me. I'm getting calls every day from businesses who are entitled to these grants automatically because they're paying directly and still haven't got the money. Are you seeing that reflected from your membership whenever you're consulting with them? And to add one more to that, you talked about Wales and England. Um, I've been banging on about the Welsh Economic Resilience Fund. Do you think it had created the thing? But it is so broad in its intentions, and it's so it covers so many bases with grants of up to 100,000. Is that something you'd like to see rolled out here that would maybe be more beneficial to the sector? Thanks in advance. Well, I think to, to take your first point... Um Look, it's only six weeks ago that this whole thing uh, started to unfold, and if any scheme was being implemented uh, of this scale in normal times, we, we would all think that six weeks was a ridiculously short period of time to have any expectations around it. The flip side of that is that some businesses saw their business closed mm -hmm. and collapse six weeks ago, and they're still waiting to get resource through. So it's not a matter, I think, of, of blame. I think the department has moved at a, a remarkable speed and the officials in there have done a, a tremendous job on identifying the people that they have and putting in place the resources they have. But inevitably, there are still a lot of people falling through the gaps. And I suppose it's, it's the nature of a crisis like this that we then start to understand the economy that we're working within, the systems we're working within. We didn't necessarily need to understand it all beforehand. Uh, but businesses that pay a bundled service charge that includes rent rates, broadband, heat and light, uh, we never needed to know about that before because the system worked uh, worked okay as it was. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think that the, the, two, the two stories we're hearing are both correct. I think the Minister is, is right to, to commend her officials for what they have achieved, but I think that, the, that your constituents and our members uh, that we're hearing from, and bear in mind we, we mostly hear from the ones who um, are being badly affected, but we do get quite a lot of calls from people phoning up just to say how the system has worked for them. Uh, I think both sides of that story are true, and that's the point I would make, is that we need to move uh, to identify need and then move with real speed to get to there to address it. I think that the, the risk of um, further schemes and further rollouts and so on like that is that there's a sense that it's jammed tomorrow for some businesses and they won't last until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Turn to your second point about the, the Welsh Economic Resilience Fund. Uh, we, grass is always greener, isn't it? We, all, we always look to other people and think that they're doing something different or, and it's probably better. Um, I think um, it, there's quite a lot of attractive initiatives that have been rolled out in both Scotland and Wales in particular. Um, and I think we're looking to those uh, really to try and learn lessons because, again, this isn't about trying to outdo, outdo each other. It's trying to see it, if we move in different ways how can we learn lessons from the other people, um, either things that don't work or things that do work? So um, we have a number of initiatives still yet to come down the track within Northern Ireland. I think we need to get those in place as quickly as possible because they're already in the design stage. We need to get them implemented and then look again to see what gaps there are. And I think it might have been Claire earlier who made the point um, that the £10,000 was announced in March was was a stopgap measure that was announced in March. We're just about into May now, so we've got to consider, okay, um, that maybe, maybe manage the situation at that point. When are we going to uh, revisit it with further support for those same businesses that were identified as being in such need at that time? 
Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Um, Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and good to speak to you again. Roger, thanks for your input. No, no morning, Gordon. And uh, we, we do appreciate it. We know you, you do represent a large uh, number of businesses out there right across a, a huge range. Um, yes, I agree. We need to speed up the process. We're all getting daily calls about, uh, about problems, about issues. Um, and you're right, officials uh, have worked hard, I suppose at the very senior level, to try and deliver this. And there are complications. We had the Easter break in, this, in the middle of it as well, which didn't help. But um, just a, the, a couple of schemes that are pending, I think, which will help a lot, is in the rental sector one, which we've been all banging on about. We need to get that sorted. And we were hoping it's, it was going to happen this week. I'm not sure it is going to happen this week now. But um, I think that will go a long way to, to help uh, a lot of your businesses People, as I call them, they're sub-renting within in a business and they don't pay any rates directly. So I think they need to be uh, looked after. We're lobbying hard for them. We fully recognise we meet them every day in the street and we um, do business with them regularly and I think we need to support them. And they're very much part of the, the makeup of our, our business sector out there in Northern Ireland. Now people are working in smaller units, working more independently and I, we need to support them. The hardship... Uh, fund, which I understand will come through this week, uh, will, uh, I think will, will go some way towards helping a lot of them. And we, we need, and we will continue to monitor that and talk to the Minister and make sure that the criteria there is acceptable. The other point, and I may have missed it because I, I nipped out, Roger, is a thing I feel is not correctly right, and then that um, multiple sites, anyone with more than three, I believe, is not eligible for any of the grants. Uh, that's my understanding, and I just don't get that fully why that is the case. And uh, what is your thoughts on that? Well, to pick up on that last point first, I, I would entirely agree, and I think uh, they also agree in Scotland. So in Scotland, they have recognised that there may be some economies of scale, so they give the full grant to the first business, but then they still give a, a significant proportion of repeat grants uh, to others within the group. And I think that has to be right, because this... Uh, this is about trying to protect uh, businesses and every unit or every shop that is, whether it's within a, a group ownership or not, it's effectively a, a self-standing trading business. If it weren't viable, it wouldn't be operating in normal times. So the fact that it is there means that it is a proper business. And as such, I think that it's, it's unwise and probably short-sighted not to, or to, 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 I suppose, to rule out multiples like that. Um, because the objective here is not about um, penalising success. It's actually about trying to keep as many businesses standing as possible so as we have employment uh, on the far side of this crisis and service to the economy as well. So, yes, I think that we, we've, we've made the decisions to, so far to do what we've done. And I think there are lessons to be learned in this and probably learned quickly and, uh, and maybe um, slightly put the hand on the tiller and change course a little bit just now. OK, and the other two schemes that are coming in are we're pushing hard for you think they will obviously help a lot of your members? I, I, I think they will. I suppose it's the old thing that the devil is in the detail uh, about how um, difficult or easy will it be to access the hardship fund and so on, but particularly how quick, uh, how quick will it be? Uh, and I suppose we would urge in these sort of odd times, there are probably um, a lot of um, civil servants who are less fully deployed than they might normally be. And there's maybe an opportunity to um, to bring them in to, to give the assistance in the frontline departments so that we get processing done much more quickly uh, of these new and um, I suppose if, if a, an existing civil servant in the Department of Finance or Department of the Economy is having to learn about a new system, there seems to us very little reason why a, a civil servant from another department couldn't learn about that new system at just a, a similar rate. So let's bring in some more human resource to deal with it and get the financial resource out to the companies that need it. Great. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Roger. Um, John? Roger, uh, thank you very much for your uh, contribution to today's meeting. Um, I, I know you're ever the diplomat, but I get a growing sense from the small business sector of growing frustration and, indeed, in some parts of it, anger uh, about the slowness of some of the supports coming through. Uh, and we've all identified in Furnace, the department in Furnace is doing it as much as it can, because we are reinventing the wheel practically every week. Uh, but 
we do have to keep the pressure on to get the money out the door and into business owners' pockets so they can stabilise their business, keep whatever employees they have uh, remaining, and also then build towards economic growth in the future. But my, my, the point I want to make is this. Uh, I would have concerns that going forward towards the future that the focus is invest in I on foreign <coughs> direct investment, uh, etc. And the global economy has ground almost to a halt. I note from budget papers that we'll be looking at later that Invest INI handed back £27 million in the January monitoring rounds. Uh, now, we will investigate that further as to why that's the case, but I believe that uh, the future of our economy rests in the small business sector, who also feed into the global economy and into the supply chains as well. But your sector, uh, you represent, and there's other representative bodies there as well, will play a key crucial part in rebuilding our economy going to the future. So one of the, 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 the themes that I noted from your contribution was identifying need. And thus far what we have done is we have tried to stabilise cash flow. Uh, we have tried to stabilise uh, employment in the, in the sense of the furlough scheme. But how do we support businesses going forward to reopen uh, in a safe manageable way. So some of the businesses you had mentioned there, for instance, the dentists, do we need to ensure that there's a grant scheme or some sort of funding to ensure that dentists have proper PPE? Do we need to look at businesses in terms of physical infrastructure around horseback screening, uh, around ensuring that uh, the business owner, staff <coughs> and customers are safe? So has, has your organisation done any work in relation to identifying need in the sense of how government supports you in reopening with those physical measures that you may require to take? Uh, yes, well, John, th thanks for the question and uh, <laughs> thanks for the badge of being a, a diplomat. Uh, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right that businesses are angry. The ones that are not getting assistance are angry and who wouldn't be if they've seen, in many cases, their life's work uh, is being um, destroyed around them and they don't see any assistance coming. But I think, you know, cool heads are required here to see, OK, well, how can we help them? And I suppose if you if you draw a parallel with the health service, you know, um, when, when the assembly came back in just a few weeks ago, really, it was because there was a, a different health crisis at that point. But that health service that was in crisis then has suddenly been transformed yet again to respond to a different one uh, and has really upped its game in an extraordinary way. And that's really what we're looking for the, the civil service to do here you know, it's, it's, it has already moved fast and far to assist the economy, but it probably still needs to go faster and further still if it's going to carry on with the work because we're by no means at the end of this situation. Now, you mentioned Invest NI. I think uh, they, they too are, I mean, we are engaging with them regularly. Uh, and I had a phone call this morning at 8 o'clock with their uh, entrepreneurship ambassador, Eleanor McAvoy, just looking at, at the thinking that needs to be done to move us beyond this, to sort of reposition us, uh, to, to ensure that the, um, the economy is, is going to be able to, to be least damaged and also best able to capitalise on, on the situation as soon as we, we release the lockdown. Um, you talked about stabilisation um, and cash flow and so on. I think uh, the Minister alluded to it this morning. One of the things we're getting from our members a lot is that their business is still locked down. There's no immediate sense of that changing. And yet, as far as they know, they're going to get a rates bill uh, in June, uh, payable from July onwards. So I think the sooner we can find a way of giving some degree of certainty for the rest of this financial year, the better. Again, it just takes off a pressure and it allows a bit of stability to, to come into the planning process. And then you asked about what other measures could be done. Well, I, it seems to me that the most effective way, the most effective intervention uh, to keep businesses afloat is to try and get them back to work so that it's the economy that keeps them going rather than, um, than grant aid and, and other interventions. So the um, uh, executive has already set up a forum to consult on this, and it produced a very good piece of work, which was the guidance on how to, how to work safely in the workplace. Um, and the minister and the executive brought that forward, uh, I think, a week ago last Friday. And if I summarise, it was broadly speaking, say, if you can work within these safe guidelines, then you should be able to operate. 
And it, it seems to me that that's probably the best way that uh, the executive and the assembly can get things moving again is to find out how can businesses operate safely and then let them do that. It has to be with the safety of the employees, of the customers and the general public in mind. But the guidance of that forum produced and that the minister brought forward through the executive, I think, does set out very clearly how they can operate safely like that. And that's probably something we need to start to, um, to, to move forward with so that we can open up sections of the economy uh, in a safe and controlled way. And that way, it's actually the economic activity that will stabilise those businesses rather than trying to, to um, fund it just through uh, the executive's limited resources. Thank you. Thank you. Sinead. Um, thank you, uh, Roger, for your presentation and your briefing. Um, the one thing that I would like to ask you, what is, what is your uh, feedback uh, in relation to the business loans, the interruption loans, and um, do you feel that the new 100% loan, the bounce back loan, uh, recently uh, announced by the, the Treasury, will be a positive, um, a positive uh, package for, for your small businesses? Or are they feeling that they are getting the loans that required and the cash into their accounts as quickly as, uh, as was first envisaged uh, by the, the, the loan scheme? Well, thank you. I think the, the um, initial um, funding that was announced under that um, was, was interesting and then rapidly uh, all of its flaws were, were exposed um, and it just wasn't achieving what it was intended to do. So there were qu uh, changes made quite quickly um, some of which were in response to, I think, in, um, lobbying by my colleagues in London, just to highlight the, the reasons why the system wasn't working. Uh, we saw those changes made, and, uh, and gradually that's rippling out. And I know we've, we've had a lot of conversations with local banks, and I think that there, there's definitely been a, uh, a change in the way that that funding has been working. Um, I think it's, it's very much still work in progress. Uh, we're looking at different surveys showing how it's, it's not succeeding, it's not hitting the mark, but those surveys may be a few days out of date. Now, uh, in, the, in the history of this scheme, a few days is actually quite a large part of its lifetime. So I'm, I'm relatively assured by, by um, leading local bankers that the system seems to be working now the way uh, its second iteration was intended and that they're quite encouraged that businesses that need funds through it are getting it. Uh, the bounce back loans are, are very new. We, we saw them coming out just, just in the past couple of days or so, and uh, we're needing to get more detail on the way they're being implemented and the way the criteria are being applied, and then get some feedback from our members as to um, what their actual experience is before we'll be able to evaluate that. So that might be a few days yet before we've got a real sense of it. We have got a survey out live in the field. Uh, it closes tonight. And I know we've had a huge response from Northern Ireland members on that, uh, which we'd be happy to share with you probably towards the end of next week. I think we would hopefully have the first reports on it, uh, but that's specifically around all of these sorts of initiatives and so on. So uh, it, we're keeping a lot of lines in the water uh, and, uh, and just getting a sense from what the members tell us about these various initiatives almost on a weekly basis. Thank you. Claire, can you hear us okay? Hello, yes, I can. Uh, good morning, Roger. Um, thanks for your input so far. Um, I, I suppose it's kind of to follow on from the question that Sinead um, had asked in and around the, the, the government loans. I'm finding particularly small businesses are reluctant to take out any more debt, um, anticipating that they may not recover um, from this, particularly those businesses that would be based around tourism or leisure or, or salons. And is, is there anything that we can do to give those businesses reassurance? And I'm really reluctant to do that because I don't know their business and I don't know if they are likely to recover. So we're almost in a catch-22 where they need the support and if they don't get it, they may go to the wall. But equally, they don't want to take the support in the form of a loan, knowing that that will be a debt. And the other question um, I would put to you as well is how are you finding um, creditors are responding to businesses? I think some of these government support schemes, indeed the slowness that um, they are in being uh, concluded, um, are assuming that creditors are going to be giving um, their uh, 
people uh, holidays or you know are allowing um, them maybe not to pay this month or, or or in the next couple of months but I'm not finding that's happening and I'm thinking that the response from the banks has been quite poor and any um, uh, inquiries I make it tends to be oh, we'll do it on a case-by-case basis but I'm hearing they're not they're not really being as supportive as they're suggesting publicly that they are and I, I, I worry as well that what is the long-term impact on uh, businesses' accessibility to credit if they do take these loans? I know this is a very extraordinary circumstance, and I would hope that it wouldn't have an impact, but I, I don't have confidence that it won't. Yeah, I think you're... you're um, good morning, Claire. I think you're, you're highlighting some of the, the, the really tricky, tough issues around this. So to, to take the two, the, um, in terms of the debt that always has to be a personal decision by the business owner yes. um, and I think therefore going back to the earlier point um, about and I, I, if I do and if I misquote her I do it um, genuinely as it were uh, when the minister said last week that you know if businesses can operate safely within the guidance produced by the forum then they should be open I think that yes. is the way that you'll you'll um, enable those businesses to, that that can then look at that guidance and say, well, can we operate within those safety guidelines? And if so, then they've got a real, realistic expectation of having a business at the end of this. If mm. they look at that guidance and think, actually, no, uh, in the sort of business I have, I can't see how I could continue to carry on my business and comply with that guidance, then I think those sorts of businesses would be probably very reluctant to, to saddle themselves with debt um, mm. with no prospect of paying it back. That then comes back, of course, to the nature of the conditions around the debt. If there's no personal guarantee and there's no risk to them, it may be a gamble they're prepared to take and, and feel that the government is backing their gamble, uh, that they will try and keep the business afloat using government funds if it doesn't put them personally at risk and hope that they can get to the far side of that and have a business which can then continue to create employment and pay taxes and therefore pay back the, the support the government has put into it. Um, but as I say, it's, it's horses for courses, and I think what we can do is try and make sure that if there are safe ways that business can get back to some degree of normality, that we put those in place and we, we champion them and support them um, so that it's done responsibly and, and, um, and wisely. Uh, your, second, <clears throat> excuse me, your second point about um, creditors and so on, it, it's, it's fascinating. Again, I think we've seen about supply chains in this whole uh, experience about how totally interrelated things are. Um, and we've had a lot of calls from people who are at various points in that supply chain. So one member from me, actually, I think from your constituency uh, mm -hmm. last week, who had decided to give his tenants a uh, 100% rent holiday, simply on the basis that he felt that um, he had the capacity to do that. And he, if they survived, he would still like to have them as tenants afterwards. Yeah, um, right. now, now, that was effectively him spending his own money to try and keep somebody else in business. Um, mm -hmm. If he hadn't done that, they almost certainly would have gone under more quickly. Um, yeah. So I, I think you're seeing a whole lot of different varieties of, of responses and actions in the in circumstances. And I think we all look to people further up the chain, the bigger businesses and particularly government, uh, to make sure that it, it pays its debts, pays them quickly and keeps the cash flow going. But, you know, we, we saw the announcement from British Airways this morning, you know, companies of that size, um, considering laying off um, 12,000 staff, shows that there's virtually no sector of the economy that's immune from this. So um, I think we all need to try and behave responsibility, re responsibly, look after our customers and look after our suppliers and try and keep as much of the thing moving as normally as possible until we get beyond this. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm really pleased to hear about my constituent landlord. That's that's fine. Um, mm. I, I kind of, uh, the, the other point that's something that you had sort of raised is that, again, to come back to the debt part of it, I, I do find that businesses are taking the risk of reopening. And again, I, I, I still don't think the, the rules around essential business and that are, are still entirely clear because they would rather make some money in this interim rather than take on a debt and i understand that you know um and if they can and they feel that they can you know stay within the the, the guidelines and the and the restrictions then that's fine but that's also having another impact in in terms of reputation as well which we're saying um i, I find it really uh, interesting that there's a number of small businesses who were heavily criticized for considering to reopen yet other businesses who probably have more capital behind them um 
uh, were opening and weren't getting that same criticism. And it's a really fine balance. Um, and I hope that when we emerge from this, those businesses, you know, will, will be seen for doing what they can just to survive. Well, I think you make a couple of very interesting points in there. One, that you, you said essential businesses, and I think we've seen the term essential and priority bandied around as if they're yeah. interchangeable. And that's why uh, I think small businesses felt that the, the department's intervention, the minister's statement last week was actually very helpful because it was okay. it was just tipping that balance towards if you can operate within the safe guidelines and, and that it was actually yeah. about how you operate, not um, which sector you're in, that that, mm -hmm. that was important. So therefore, I think we all feel that the guidelines on operating safely are actually the thing that should drive us, not what sector you're in so much. And yeah, the, sec yeah. the second thing, I think uh, and that, that sort of knocks on to the reputational issue. But we had a business on the phone yesterday, uh, and this is an interesting example. Mm -hmm. So they have a, a burger uh, outlet. I'll not name them because other, mm -hmm. other other companies are available. But they have a, have a burger outlet, and they have it right beside a retail park in which there are um, a number of major food shops. Um, so their take on it is that they should open and they will be opening on Monday for drive through only on the basis that they can uh, service the customers who are coming to the food unit. Um, they can keep some degree of trading going and therefore they can actually hopefully have some staff employed and have a business at the end of it. And it, they feel that they're entirely within both the letter and the spirit of the um, uh, the guidance and regulations that have been put out to date. And I think that there is a, a duty probably on the Assembly to, to just maybe try and lead public opinion and absolutely not to have gung-ho uh, open any business at all costs, but actually to have a sense that we, we need to have the economy working and um, that it is right and responsible to protect people's livelihoods at the same time as we protect people's lives. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, thank you, Roger. Um, Roger, thank you very much for that. And um, the the input. Wait, do you want a question? Um, the... sorry, sorry, can I just ask one point on that last? Yes, go ahead. Um, Roger, your last comment comes back to the point that I was making during my contribution. I, I think it would be useful. I, I know you did the working group in terms of the executive between business uh, and the executive around how businesses can open safely. But you, you, you mentioned, for instance, there are uh, a takeaway burger place opening. Okay. Um, I, I think it would be useful if there was some sort of engagement around what protective equipment such businesses require and how government, if they can, assist them in that, uh, in, in that so they can open safely where, where they do protect staff and they do protect customers. I, I think there's an angle there. We, we have identified the need for cash flow, job, our, our payment of wages, uh, help with rates, etc. All those things have been identified. But I think the missing element is how we support business with ensuring they have the proper equipment for their staff and protection for their customers for when, to allow it to open safely when it is appropriate to do so. I think that's a very interesting point, John, a good point. Um, I suppose that the the question, I was, it comes around to, to guidance and, and gi giving good guidance and good information. I suppose that if the executive were providing PPE, probably most businesses would feel that it should be provided for the likes of the care homes and the frontline workers in those sectors. Yeah. And that if, you, if we can put in place guidance that will allow businesses to get back into operation, then they will be content to pay for the PPE themselves, just as one of the overheads of making sure that they can be operational. So therefore, if we're clear about the guidance and the ways that we can let them work, then they will probably get on with that. So I was minded, just as you're saying that, of a, I got a delivery of, uh, of um, uh, computer stuff through yesterday just to assist my home working. And the delivery driver, self-employed delivery driver, arrived up uh, with face mask on and gloves as he then took the parcel out the back of the, the, uh, the van and left it to be collected. So there's no physical contact with anybody, but even so, as a self-employed business owner, he had taken those initiatives, both as supposed to protect himself and to protect his customers. And I think that's what we'll probably see more of. As long as we give good guidance around what is needed to operate safely, then businesses will probably put that in place in the way that they do with all other safety equipment and, and health and safety uh, measures.
really important to us and um, we look forward to getting the, the survey results as well in the next um, week or so um, and we will obviously like I said reflect your, your comments back to the department for um, input to them also um, and thank you very much for being with us this morning. Thank you all very much indeed. Appreciate Thanks. that and thank you Dr Archibald. Um, our next briefing, which is with the Vice Chancellors of Ulster and Queen's University, um, and I think both of the Vice Chancellors are on the line. Right, yeah. Can you yeah. hear us okay? The Pubafone is here. Hello. Hello, professors. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Can you hear me? Yeah, is that yes, right? I'm here too, Chair. Thank you. Um, if you want to go ahead and give us um, your kind of opening briefing and then members will have questions. Yes, of course. Perhaps I can start off. Thanks. Um, so the universities in Northern Ireland are already playing a fairly major role in the acute response to the C-19 pandemic. As you know, we're part of a consortium that delivers on the testing for Northern Ireland. We've graduated nurses and doctors early to get them into the workforce. We've converted our teaching and assessments online to meet the needs of our students. We've cancelled our accommodation contracts, which were for Queen's cost 3.5 million to reduce student hardship. But we're going to play an even greater role in the socio-economic recovery from the pandemic. And I know the committee has been discussing that recovery phase this morning. Northern Ireland is already challenged economically when compared to other regions in the UK. And we're going to be one of the hardest hit. Just yesterday, the Danske Bank estimate was a 7.5% shrinkage in our economy. We also have one of the lowest R&D investment levels in the UK. Scotland gets three times more than Northern Ireland, London four times more. Yet such investment is absolutely key to economic growth, as emphasised by the UK's regional policy to level up. The universities deliver a lot of economic impact. Queen's alone delivers 1.9 billion of economic impact every year, emphasising the importance of our sector. So the critical time for universities to be able to respond is actually in the autumn, when the new academic year starts and the economy is recovering. And that's when the, the impact on us will actually be maximum, and, but we need decisions now to prepare for those challenges. We want to be ready to meet the needs of both intense competition and unpredictable demand. The competition comes from the forecast losses stemming from loss of international students in the sector, which across the UK on teaching income alone, excluding accommodation, etc., is 2.4 billion. That's a massive hit. For Northern Ireland, London Economics have forecast a 29 million hit on teaching income alone before we add losses from accommodation, conferencing, etc. And for Queen's, our forecast losses look to be in the range of around 34 million to over 80 million. So big challenges, big risks and many uncertainties. So why is Northern Ireland different? Why are we here for your support? And what solutions can we offer to meet the challenges that you've been discussing this morning that really challenge our economy and our society? And to set this out, I'd like to do three things. I want to highlight the differences between our system in England highlight the challenge for Northern Ireland in a UK approach and propose a solution. So in terms of differences, Northern Ireland recruits minimal students from Great Britain, but Great Britain recruits almost 5,000 students a year from Northern Ireland. They fish in our waters, but we don't really fish in theirs. They also attract a higher unit of resource for their students than Northern Ireland universities. So they have more students and more funding. In Northern Ireland, we operate with a cap on Northern Ireland student recruitment, while England has no cap. Northern Ireland is relatively disadvantaged in provision of higher education places. We only have around 60 places per, per 100 applicants, and in England it's 120. So we've got lower capacity, we get a lower unit of resource, and we're capped. So in England, the universities can try and mitigate the loss by attracting increased numbers of home students, but we can't do that. They can attract our students to mitigate their losses, but we are not in a position to drive up our, our home recruitment to do the same. And we really need to be ready to meet the needs of Northern Ireland students, who may, of course, choose not to travel this year to GB, given the uncertainties and the needs of the economy. They may want to stay here. 
and so we're in a time of great uncertainty in predicting student numbers. Although we lose almost 5,000 students a year, we've got insufficient graduates in Northern Ireland to meet the needs of the economy. And we need a strong pipeline of graduates to deal with the econ economic recovery from COVID-19 and also as we transition to a knowledge-based economy. Looking across the HE sector, I've told you that the losses stem largely from the loss of international student income. But that's a very serious loss that could destabilise the sector and some institutions in England will have their viability threatened. The university sector has proposed a set of solutions to government and in Northern Ireland, we broadly support them, but recognise that there need to be some differences taken, taken into account in how it's employed in Northern Ireland. So that proposal is about student number controls in England, capping universities at, the, at last year's intake plus 5%. But across the sector, that's 23,000 extra places. And these places have to be filled, and Northern Ireland is one place to fill them from. The second part of the proposal from the university sector to government is that the UK research funding is addressed by support directly from government to make up the challenges there. Because UK research funding doesn't meet the full cost of the research, universities have to find it from another part of their business and who are under financial stress with loss of international income. That will make it very challenging. Yet we need to, we need to preserve the research base ready for economic recovery. So the universities with high numbers of international students and large research portfolios will be hardest hit. But these are often the universities with the biggest reputations who can attract more home students and, and so could create a major shift in student admission flows. The loss of the international students creates enormous capacity both for teaching and university accommodation. And when that's coupled with a financial deficit, an obvious mitigation, as I've said, is to maximise home student recruitment. Hence, there is going to be intense competition within the sector and an urgency to secure as many confirmed applicants as possible. In the absence of A-levels this year, GB universities started to issue offers based on predicted grades. That was going to create incredible volatility in the sector, and so a, a moratorium has been placed on admissions until the 4th of May, pending a sector-wide approach. So what are the solutions? We would like to see Northern Ireland universities and university colleges, for that matter, on an even footing to compete with the rest of the UK universities where we are already seriously disadvantaged. We'd like to see flexibility in MASN as the demand for our places will be unpredictable and indeed could soar if you see a big shift to students wishing to stay at home. We need an increase in our funded numbers so that we can respond as an English university is doing with the 5% increase. And we need support from you in proceeding with admissions using robust calculated grades if GB universities start to make offers to our students so that we don't disadvantage Northern Ireland applicants. And finally, we'd like to ensure that any Barnet consequentials of an uplift in UK research funding for universities actually comes to the universities here in Northern Ireland. When all of this is done, I think these issues highlight the need for us to look again at our sustainable funding um, system for universities in Northern Ireland, a topic that I've discussed before with the committee. Now is not the time, but I would hope when we're in the recovery phase, we can turn our sights on creating a better environment for the universities to meet the needs of the people of Northern Ireland and to drive the economy. And I'll pass you on to Paul now. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, presuming it's okay just to go uh, uh, ahead. Um, I'd just like to say thanks to the committee for the opportunity to talk with you this morning, particularly as we weren't enabled, we were unable to meet as scheduled when the, the committee was to meet on our McGee campus. We were very much looking forward to that. Uh, also listening this morning, we welcome the Minister's comment on the Economic Advisory Group, and we offer our direct support there, and I'm sure Queen's does too. Clearly, universities in Northern Ireland have a really significant role to play in supporting and delivering the economic recovery of the region. And uh, I think both institutions represented here today are committing to do so. I think like, like Queen's, uh, Ulster University is, is already making a significant contribution to Northern Ireland's response, and uh, it, regardless of what we would want to do in, in the future, uh, our nursing students graduated early to, to go into the sector and to support the COVID response. We have staff members, including the Dean of our proposed medical schools, working on the front line. 
Um, we've teamed up with, with Queen's and have formed a consortium to tackle diagnostic testing. Um, we, we've worked on data analytics and so forth to inform Northern Ireland, as we have with our economic policy centre to provide vital analysis and, and so forth. We worked with local industry for the building of um, face shields and so forth. So I think universities are already making um, you know, big, a big contribution to, to the battle against COVID. In terms of where the committee might be interested in terms of what sorts of things are we doing for our, our, our students, I think staff at um, our institution, I'm sure at Queen's, have done an amazing job in moving teaching online. We, we started off by ensuring, um, by, by trying to survey our students and, and find out what access they had to online teaching, and that enabled us to, to bespoke our provision quite a lot. And as of today, the survey that our students' union are doing indicate an 82%, I think, uh, satisfaction, which is in line, really, with what the, the NSS delivers a, around a sector average every year uh, anyway. So we regard that as quite, quite good news. We've taken steps to redesign assessment to ensure that no students are disadvantaged, but it's also been really important that the value of the degrees that the students get are, are, are just as good, and so we've taken steps to ensure that the quality of the degrees are not diminished while not disadvantaging um, students. For Ulster, you'll know, know that about 37% of our students come from the lowest two quintiles of, uh, quintiles of economic and social disadvantage. Our committee members will know we've got a really good track record of um, of success for those students and, and it's really been really important to us to remain committed to supporting them during this time and, and for them of course it, it, it may be much more difficult so we've had to ensure that we've reserved our library loan laptops for those students we've donated laptops to WP students where our survey showed that there was a need and we've been consulting with DFE concerning how we might translate some of the bursaries that we offer into vouchers for technologies that will, will help us going forwards should uh, we still be in uh, a lockdown way of working. It's also really been important for us not to forget our research students and staff, and I think Ian touched on, on, on the research uh, challenge, and, and, and we hold in review how we ensure that we can uh, maintain some access to, to labs and other capital infrastructure so that um, vital work is, is continued while working within the guidance available. In terms of the COVID risks, um, I think Professor Greer has covered off uh, many of them, especially in relation to the, the admissions piece. And, and indeed, he and I talk multiple times a week to ensure that we work together and with DfE to ensure that we get the possible outcome, best possible outcomes for prospective students and, and for the regions as a whole. Um, in terms of financial Im impact, Ian's covered that you know in our institutions are, uh, operate a financial disadvantage. At Ulster, we've got that additional financial disadvantage of operating on multiple campuses in support of our regional mission. And, and I'm not doing that to kind of bang that drum in, in particular here. I, I raise it because in relation to COVID, there's no doubt that uh, that context has just decreased our financial resilience to economic shocks. And of course, COVID uh, certainly is that. Um, I would uh, estimate our projected deficits are, are in the range of about 25 to 64 million pounds over about a three year period. And again, the sensitivity analysis is quite broad because of the, we don't know how long um, lockdown is, is going to go on and so forth. But going forwards, we know that investment in higher education uh, at this time um, to facilitate upskilling and cross-skilling of our population, I think, represents one of the few opportunities that we'll have as a region to pump prime the NI economy for future uh, economic recovery. And I think we'd all agree that, that that recovery will be vital to the health and well-being of the people of the region. So the universities stand ready to do what we can. We're doing a lot already. Uh, we wish to, to contribute. We're well placed to, to contribute. And, and we're, sorry, we're, we're asking for an on, ongoing review of the context within which we operate to help us uh, help the region, really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think all of us would recognise the, the, um, the way in which universities have stepped up to the plate in terms of the efforts um, yep. to fight COVID-19. And I think that also extends to um, Open University and the regional colleges as well. Um, and I, I think that all of you need to be very much commended for that. And we are very grateful for that response. Um, if I could just pick up on, on, I suppose, two questions around what, what you have mentioned this morning directly to do with um, the, the next academic year. In terms of the MAS and flexibility, I know there has been some discussions with the Minister and the Department around that. Um, has there been a, a positive response in terms of looking at that and um, the funding that may need to go alongside it? And then just in relation to the um, QR funding, um, is it envisaged that that would be directed, that there would be a Barnet consequential directly coming from that, that would be directly to us here in the north, or would it have to be applied for through UKRA? That's me. 
Well, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm sure we can both answer um, your, your two questions. With regards to the latter question, it's not been decided yet how the research funding would come through. Okay. It may be that um, it doesn't come through as QR, um, but it, we anticipate the likeliest mechanism for it to come to Northern Ireland would be through a Barnet consequential, and hence we'd like that to be protected. Um, with regards to your, uh, your first point, we have had very good discussions with the department and with the minister. We've not got any conclusion yet, and that's partly because we, we, we do wish to be part of a UK solution. But the case that, that Paul and I have made is that there are some special situations with regards to the Northern Ireland position that need to be taken into account and that UK uh, solution is brought forward. If we don't get an uplift in our student numbers and we don't get the QR or equivalent research support, then we simply will be further disadvantaged and less able to compete, less able to close the gap, and effectively will be donating our students from Northern Ireland to the GB economy because we are unable to meet the local needs. I would emphasise that we really can't predict what the local needs will be. We are seeing quite a lot of inquiries from students wanting to stay in Northern Ireland rather than go to GB. Whether that will be translated, we don't know, but we do recognise we need to be flexible to meet the needs of our economy and our young people. And I think Ian's um, point there in relation to wanting to be flexible is, is absolute, absolutely key. There's a lot of ambiguity in how that market would translate out, not least in the latter part of the market as we go into a clearing phase. Ian and I have had discussions about, and we regard it as um, somewhat disappointing that the UCAS system is being made even more flexible in the latter part of uh, this admission cycle, um, and that could introduce much more ambiguity uh, in the latter part of that, of that market. In any given year, operating within a, a, a cap is described by some people in my institution of trying to land a helicopter on the, on the head of a pin. You have to get it, get it just right. And as Ian says, having a bit more flexibility in being able to flex uh, upwards if we need to, to support the region and the students who, who may or may not be wish or be able to go over to GB is, is really in, important so that we continue to invest in our young people. Um, but we also have to be mindful of the risk that um, we, there might be great pressure on our students to go elsewhere, and, and they may well do so, and what that might mean for us in terms of uh, how we approach the admissions cycle. At the moment, we're both as institutions working hard with DfE to hold that uh, UK-wide position. We don't know how long that's going to um, hold. It's incumbent upon us to have some contingency plans, which we've been uh, co-developing, and we've tried to be as transparent as possible with the department about what, what we might be able to do about that. Okay, thank you. I'm um, Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, gentlemen, for your presentations. Um, in relation to the student accommodation, I think we appreciate the, the work that's been done there. How are you going to, to meet that cost or that loss? And uh, does this apply to the private sector accommodation the modern blocks that we've seen considerable investment in, especially in Belfast? I'd perhaps go first and Ian can, can, can follow up. I, I think in relation to, yes, the university has uh, suffered some, some losses. Uh, ours is in, in the similar region to uh, Ian's uh, as well. And it's just one of the kind of operating losses that we've, that we've had to sustain within our budgets going forwards. DfE has sought to, for us to um, collate the totality of our losses and to, to lay them out and put them and put them forwards, and, and, and we've shared that. In relation to the private accommodation, there's a mixed picture. There are some private um, accommodation providers for, for student-specific accommodation where there have been refunds, and there are some that, that, that haven't. Universities, uh, certainly our university hasn't been in a position to mitigate for uh, other renters, but we've done what we can where uh, our students staying our own owned uh, accommodation and we, we, we've, made those, um, we've made those refunds to, to the students. But going forwards, you're, you're, you're right, we have taken uh, losses in, in, in relation to that uh, and we just have to bear them within our uh, overall operating expenditures. Yeah, I, I would agree with Paul. Um, we, we both took these losses because it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and we have to somehow absorb them into our overall financial um, uh, planning. And that's why it's really important that we mitigate the losses. And at present, 
with our current system, we're not able to mitigate the losses in the same way that an English university could, and that's one of the things we'd like to correct. In addition, because we can't really um, control what happens in the private sector, we have made additional funds available uh, in our hardship fund for students. And I know that the Minister's already told you this morning that, that she wishes that, that for DEFI to contribute to that also. And we hope that indirectly, therefore, we can meet some of the private sector issues through that hardship fund. Okay, thank you. Just on the cap then, I suppose it, the point was made more in relation to Queen's. Uh, you, want to, you, want, you would like to see the cap on the number of students lifted to obviously uh, be able to bring uh, increase your numbers. Will you then have an knock-on effect then in relation to your resources, staff, accommodation, funding, etc., if you were to see a significant increase in numbers? Well, first of all, we took a loss. Both universities took a loss of around 1,000 places in 2015. And secondly, we are anticipating a reduction in the international numbers who will be coming. So we don't envisage an, a major issue with accommodation um, either on campus or off, camp, compact, uh, off campus in terms of student housing. So we believe, and I'm sure Paul would agree, that both universities could cope with an increase in numbers from Northern Ireland. It's important to add um, to what Ian has said when we're, we're talking about the resource for that. What, what we're calling for is an increase in, in funded Mazen rather than just an ability to take uh, more students that were just um, with, within existing resource. Uh, it would need to be um, funded Mazen and to use that uh, mechanism to be able to ensure that the resource follows the additional um, student uplift uh, should we need to flex to that. And your intention would be to try and, and um, encourage and get our, our local people, young people to, to go to your universities rather than go to the mainland? I think in terms of attracting the young people to, to whether they go one way or another, we think it's really important that young people have an opportunity to go to university per se, and there may well be some pragmatic or, or, or cultural um, difficulties in people wanting to go away at home uh, at this time and we think that um, if there is a surplus of students within Northern Ireland because of the investment potential that those young people have in the future economic recovery of, of, of the region it's really important to give them an, an opportunity to, to build their skills so they can contribute to the economy uh, in the future. So as that data or those data emerge we would just like to be flexible to be able to give the opportunities to, to, to young people. I don't know, Ian, if you want to add anything to that. Only one point. I think you've set out the, the issue very well, Paul. Um, one concern that, that we both have is that if we do see an increased flow from Northern Ireland students who would otherwise have gone to GB, they may well be very able students, and we could see a displacement of widening participation students if we don't have flexibility. And neither university wants to do that because we both... Um, have enormous initiatives to meet the needs of the widening participation population. We believe we should be doing more, not less. And our risk from this, if there is a big shift, is that we could see further disadvantage to widening participation groups. Okay, gentlemen, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Gordon. Um, Sinead. Okay, thanks, Ian and um, Paul, for your uh, briefing so far. Um, just a, a reflection, sometimes it... Um, the best light comes from a burning bridge, uh, and I think you know uh, we see a lot of holes in um, our university sector and our provision of graduate level students within within Northern Ireland. Uh, and I suppose this pandemic and this crisis has shone a light on that, um, as some of the problems are are. Um, manifesting themselves at the moment. The university sector is a very competitive sector. It was before um, before uh, COVID and it'll be more so after it. And I think uh, I would support your call for flexibility in relation to Mazen, but uh, I would also probably call for um, uh, to ensure that the flexibility is uh, embedded in the courses that are required for recovering our economy, um, not just uh, Mazen per se, but um, Mazen in, in relation to the courses that are going to drive the uh, economy forward after this, because, um, I mean, the universities is, is a fundamental part of the economy uh, and growing the economy, and we can't um, have it uh, bruised and battered after uh, this COVID 
19 crisis is over. So um, that's that's the one thing that I would say that I that I would support that, and I would support as well um, the the research and development um, uh, from the Barnet Consequentials. And I think it's very very important that we do everything that we can to to uh, uphold and develop our university sector um, more so now than ever before. And then the other question is to Paul. Paul, could you probably give us a, a, a feedback on the urgency of getting sign off in the uh, uh, in the um, the postgraduate medical? Sure, I'll pick that up, up point now. We've always been transparent that there's um, for a 2021 um, start, there was a deadline uh, at the at the end of May uh, for us to be able to meet the requirements of the GMC to to, to proceed. Uh, with that, it's really important that that as a as, a, as an initiative comes uh, fully funded. I think the um, implications for us uh, due to the financial stretch that we had certainly um, not, not made any better by, by COVID is that, that we, we do need that sign off both on the, on the capital and on the recurrent side. That being in place, um, the university has been uh, ready for, for some time and indeed has already invested about £5 million of its own funds in, in the uh, development and um, the development of, of uh, securing a curriculum and the development of uh, preliminary infrastructure to take that forwards and remain committed to do so. In, in, in these times, the ability to have a functioning health service has, has, has never been brought um, more into focus um, and we think that the deficits but, um, that were outlined in the business case in, in the northwest for um, having um, health professionals being able to work there and to support the communities is, is, is as strong as ever and we remain ready to move forwards when such sign-off happens but uh, as you know it is time limited for for this this year but I'm, I'm sure that's known not by not by committee members here and indeed uh, members of the relevant departments okay thank you very much could i comment on your, on your skills question and i would say that we we support very strongly the need for um the expansion of medical school numbers in Northern Ireland is really critical and it's been emphasised with the pandemic. With regards to the skills piece, um, we agree with you that it's really important to start reskilling the population now because there have been many job losses already, as you've discussed this morning, in the SME sector in particular, uh, with people struggling. Queen's has already launched a, a new course starting now online, which will deliver a postgraduate certificate in computer science that will deliver someone with the skills to go into that profession by August of this year. So it's a relatively intense, short, sharp course. We've got another one coming down the line in supply chain management. We've had very good discussions and very good from the department in getting uh, this onto the, the stocks, if you like. But we think we've got to be responding now with that upskilling piece. And with regards to flexibility of delivery, we're looking at both online and face-to-face -face options for the new year. There may be a mixture, there may be different options depending on the needs for students, and we're also looking at delayed entry for some courses starting them in January. Thank you. Um, John O'Dowd. Okay, uh, uh, thank you uh, both to Paul and Ian. And, and add uh, to the comments already met, uh, said around your university's work in research in, in tackling this terrible disease and, and helping to lead the way and hopefully at some stage getting the medication required either to treat it or to eradicate it. And well done in terms of the support you have brought forward for your students at this time. I, I, I noted, uh, Professor Bartholomew, when you were giving your resume for Ulster University, you mentioned that you have a higher intake from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, and I am aware of that. But that, that brings to mind your decision pre-COVID-19 to increase fees for part-time courses and increase them significantly, I think around 50%. Um, I have particular concerns about the impact of that in relation to the part-time Irish language diploma. Uh, and speaking to some in this sector, there are concerns that that decision to increase those fees will see the end of that diploma in the university. And there is also, it has been mentioned to me, that that perhaps is part of the thinking of the university that they do away with that diploma. Um, will you reconsider the increase in fees 
and also take a specific look in relation to the impact of the increase of those fees in the Irish language diploma. Thanks for the question. In relation to the increase in, in the part-time fees, they still remain significantly, uh, even pro rata, below the full-time fees. Um, they were, per credit, half the amount, and now they're two-thirds of, of the amount. One of the things I think is re really in, in important when we uh, look at this is that um, we, took a, we didn't take the decision lightly. We felt that um, running those programmes uh, effectively um, at, a, at, a, at a loss has sustainability. Um, concerns we have indeed it does it is a significant percentage uh, uplift but still uh, remains well below um, the the full time price. One of the things that I think we have to uh, look at with that is the impact that that has, as you say, on those people from a widening participation background, and to not see that in isolation. We do have um, student support funds and so forth, which we would uh, commit to students in the form of um, bursaries. Uh, and we would try to um, mitigate the, the increase in fees that, that closes the gap per credit point between the full-time and part-time uh, provision to something that um, can be supported through additional bursaries and so forth. So we don't see it as a standalone price increase. We know where that impact will be, that we'd have to put some, some mitigations in, but we didn't think that it was sustainable to keep the part-time provision literally at, at 50% of the price point of the full-time full provision. Uh, and there are some equity issues between those on a full-time program and part-time program, but we're happy to, 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 to mitigate where there is need. Is the university um, committed to providing that part-time diploma in the Irish language? Because uh, I have to be honest with you, there has been concerns raised with me by, by people in the sector that the university is not committed to it. Um, and I would again ask you, because I accept the decision was made um, and these decisions are never easy. But one of the concerns that have been raised across the, 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 the sectors is there was a lack of consultation, both with students, staff, and others, before an increase was introduced across all subjects. So there's, there's a concern around that. But again, I, I have particular concern in relation to the Irish language diploma. Thank you. I, I have to say on the, on the phone line here, you, you, your voice is one that I've, I've, I've really struggled to, to hear a, a, a little bit, and I think there were some specifics in your question that I wouldn't that. want to... <laughs> Do you want me to repeat the question? Sorry, uh, maybe, maybe that's better now, is it? Take is, is that sound quality better now? No, not particularly, I'm afraid. Just give me one second. Okay. Are we getting promoted, John? <laughs> um, uh, perhaps, is that better now for you? It is a bit better, yes. yes so. Sorry about that. Um, the, the issue of the, the, the rise in part-time fees, I accept, is always a difficult one for anyone to increase costs. But there has been concerns raised across all the sectors that the increases were brought in without consultation, um, either with students or staff. And I have a particular concern that the university is not committed to delivering the part-time Irish language diploma. Can you offer any reassurances in that regard? I, I, I think the, the, the university has a, has a commitment to um, offer, offer, offer courses that are, are useful and uh, viable to across the range of its, its provision. In terms of the specifics of that, that programme, I probably don't have participation statistics here in, in, in front of me. But we are committed um, to that broad area. We, we continue to make um, to run it as a line of, of provision. And of course, the raising of the part-time fees wasn't targeted particularly in, in, that, in that area. It's to all part-time fees. And that decision really was made to balance some of the inequity there was between full and part-time provision. Um, I'll just reiterate what I said in terms of, I, I do think there are some, some special considerations for some groups of part-time students. And we need to look at the other things that we can do for those students to um, mitigate for, for, for that. But I do believe that it, it, it remains unsustainable to run the part-time provision at, at half the price. It doesn't reflect the, the, the value uh, of, the, of the programmes or indeed the, the, the cost base. And any cuts there uh, effectively mean that it's being subsidised by other areas of provision. And at Ulster University, that's already um, you know, at a, operates at a financial disadvantage, 
it, it just doesn't seem right to have that level of subsidy from our provision into that area. But it's not our intention to make it, it difficult for um, people to study. And as a consequence, we would want to use our other mitigating factors around um, bursaries and so forth to support those, those students in need. I, I appreciate it's not the ideal answer, um, but, but we do have to operate within some financial constraints, considerable, I would suggest. Uh, and, and we f try to find the, the middle ground where we can. Thank you. Um, Claire? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, good afternoon. Um, gentlemen, thank you for your contributions. I appreciate um, how difficult it is, in, particularly in relation to funding for higher education and the effects that COVID-19 might have on that, um, particularly admissions, international students and um, indigenous uh, students. Um, my question is for Paul, and Paul, I want to congratulate you on your new post. I haven't had an opportunity to meet with you yet, but I look forward to that in the future. Um, you had recently announced a public consultation on the future location of the School of Health Sciences, and I, I appreciate that is currently paused, um, just so you can get a, a more fulsome response um, whenever we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis. But I suppose my um, question is around that. Is the public consultation in itself confirmation that you have abandoned your original plan in relation to the School of Health Sciences, particularly coming to Coleraine. Your predecessor um, had, when we had originally discussed this, had described um, those courses coming to Coleraine as a pause. This consultation now suggests to me that you're rethinking that entirely, which I would be disappointed about given that Coleraine lost courses anticipating these courses coming to that campus. Mm. I, I, I mean, it's a, it, it's a difficult one, and you'll appreciate within um, Northern Ireland and Ulster's uh, contribution to that with our multiple campuses. Um, we're, we're regional, we have those multiple campuses, and, and, and my job is to ensure that, that we align our provision where it makes um, most sense for the university so that it can serve, serve the region. And in that sense, whenever we move something from one campus um, to, to, to another, uh, there's always going to be... Um, uh, disparate voices. Uh, accordingly, we have gone out to um, consultation, as you say, and that consultation is recently um, being converted into a full uh, equality impact assessment because there are uh, equality issues when you start moving students and, and, and staff around. Uh, we're on record, and certainly I'm on record, and, and I don't mind saying that in, in, in feeling that the health sciences has um, very good subject alignment with uh, the, the other ones that we have at the McGee campus with the nursing as a paramedic practice uh, there, uh, possibly a medical school and, and so forth. And for the subject alignment reason, I think that would be our, our preferred option. But we haven't come to a final uh, decision yet. It's important that we understand uh, the impact of any such decision on a wide range of stakeholders, and that's why we're doing the fullest job at that consultation piece and, and remain open um, to, 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 to going where that data suggests that we should we, we, we should go um, I mean I have a, have a health professions background uh, myself and, and and accordingly I've always been um, quite persuaded by the interprofessional um, learning aspects and the better clinical outcomes of the co-location of um, health professions and, and, and thus we do think that the subject alignment is, is, is a strong argument but but we understand that there are other arguments and that's why we're currently listening to um, other voices in the fullest way possible Okay, thank you for that. Um, and can I ask that certainly when you know you, you are considering decisions and considering the responses from the consultation when it um, begins again, that not only will you look at the stakeholders and how it aligns with other subjects, but you will look at the impact that that might have on not bringing those courses to campuses like Korean. I, I'm just really concerned that Korean is losing courses and nothing's coming there to replace it. And you know. The, it's all very well saying that you have a multi-campus um, university and that can't be funded, and I fully appreciate that, and I'm sympathetic to that argument and, and would hope that the department would support you in doing that. But my biggest fear, and it long has been a fear, is the integrity of Korean and if it has a future, and not just because, you know, I want it in my backyard. I'm conscious that... 50 years of the university, we have built up our own infrastructure and economy around the university in Korean. And by undermining that in any way, we are pulling the rug. And I, I have a worry for our tourism industry, where the students very much um, support our local economy and those out-of-season uh, tourism uh, areas. So it's not 
I, I, I would ask that you, you know, when, when you are making decisions, that you consider it not just from a university perspective, not just from a subject perspective, but actually how that impacts on the wider economy in Korea and the North West, because Northern Ireland is a relatively small place. And, you know, whether you have it in Derry or whether you have it in Korean or whether you have it in Belfast or whether you have it in Jordanstown, realistically, the journey times are minimal. And, you know, I, I think we have to look at it in the context of what currently exists and what impact that would have, because you know, uh, Ulster University plays a really important part in our local area and is a really a critical piece of our jigsaw. And I would worry about the impact if it was being undermined in any way. Sure, thank you for that, and I, and I appreciate your your your, your concerns in, in in more ways than one. You know, I I I, I, I hear them, and I, I I really appreciate the fact that, that that you care about the campus as do as as do do we. That message that we're a regional university, yes, is an overarching one, but that doesn't um, diminish the commitment that we have to all of our campuses, and indeed. Uh, we have a great deal of excellence on all, all, all of those campuses, and we wish to continue as a multi-campus institution serving those uh, economies and regions in the balanced way that we do. It's absolutely within our mission to serve uh, that regional footprint and, and, and wish to continue to do so. From time to time, we will move aspects of provision uh, around, and uh, it's important that we maintain campus balance as, as, as best we can. Um, and I think that campus balance... Um, it, it, it is the words that we should use when we're thinking about that rather than any particular growth at any particular campus. Um, we at Ulster University see ourselves with that regional footprint. We're aware that we need to achieve uh, a regional, regional balance and, and we'll make those decisions, uh, making a range of uh, considerations, including the ones that you've said in terms of uh, economic impact as and when that we need to do that to the, to the fullest extent. And, and I would hope that that's what we're doing here and I'm, I'm convinced we are. Okay, I, I appreciate that, um, and I appreciate you confirming your commitment to all campuses in Spitting Korean, and I look forward to chatting with you in the future, hopefully when we emerge from this. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gary? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and, and can I thank uh, both uh, yourselves for your contribution uh, today and uh, your contribution over this past number of weeks, uh, given the, the COVID-19 crisis. It's very much appreciated. Um, I agree with colleagues in the need for uh, flexibility going forward. I think that in all of this, whilst we're dealing with a crisis, it is an opportunity for us all to reflect on how things are done, at what courses are provided, uh, and how we access those courses. So that's something that needs to be very much looked at. Again, uh, and I suppose it's timely on the back of what, what Claire has said, uh, the medical school is vitally important, if not uh, even more important than what it, what, it, what it would have been even a couple of weeks ago, uh, given the fact that uh, we know that we need uh, doctors and GPs um, trained and recruited, uh, and we need them to stay in the west of the province as well. So uh, please do all you can to ensure that that stays up on the agenda, and we'll do our part in making sure that we can try and get it across the line the next uh, number of days. Um, I just wanted to come back to a point around communication. Um, in terms of communication with students, uh, uh, how, how are you assessing what works well and what doesn't work well with students? I, I've been in contact uh, with quite a few of them and, and they, they think that uh, the online courses and the way they've been taught actually works quite well. Uh, how are you getting that message out to them in preparation for the future and future uh, admissions going forward? Thank you, Ian. Did you want to go first? I've just been talking quite a lot. And um, yeah, yeah, happy to. Well, we're in a completely new era of how we deliver teaching. Um, and obviously, we've been communicating largely and with an online environment. Uh, we think, um, or our perception at present, is that that's been very well received. There were some anxieties with students, particularly around assessments, but we've got a no detriment policy for our assessments. And if the online approach, um, is, they feel it's a problem for them. They can come back and do the assessment when we're back into normal business, if you will. So there's no detriment and they would always get the highest outcome. So we've reassured students about some of the issues around assessments and helped them get into that new way of working. The levels of satisfaction we're seeing are probably of the same order as, as Paul's reported. So we're not seeing a, a big issue. We think the key thing for next year is flexibility because none of us can predict whether the campuses will be fully open as normal or whether we'll still have to have some online or whether we have some sort of blended approach. And so I think we're both preparing for all eventualities and keeping that flexibility. And I hope the students will appreciate the need for that flexibility and the, the issues it creates for us. But I would have to emphasise 
just how remarkable the transition was. And I have to pay tribute to the staff at Queen's, and I'm sure Paul would do the same at, at, at Ulster, because we did work that should have taken well over a year in three weeks to get the teaching and learning and assessments online, which is quite a remarkable feat. And I suspect will probably change the face of higher education delivery in Northern Ireland forever in some way. Thanks, Ian. And just to add, add to that, indeed, all praise goes to staff to doing something that would have been deemed as impossible, no, sh nothing short of impossible prior to this uh, cr crisis. I think the way in which we communicate with students remains really important. Data are our friend in, in, in relation to this. We're looking at our VLE blackboard statistics on a course-by-course -course basis. <coughs> Excuse me, to look at levels of engagement and the academic staff that, that themselves will be uh, in, in contact with, staff, uh, with students on, on a daily basis. At a more strategic level, we work closely with our student union, and it's them that's gathering uh, the data to, to inform us in terms of, of how we're doing, rather than uh, uh, ourselves. We get an, an objective sense of how well we're doing it, and we work with the student union uh, executive uh, to take their queries in relation to, to their members, and we'll work with them. As Ian says, moving forwards into semester one of the, of, of the new year is, is, is really tricky. We have to plan for all eventualities, because which eventuality we will need, we won't find out until it's too late to plan for it. So we're really trying to pivot now to in, in, ensure that we equip our, our, our staff with the capabilities to, to continue doing the excellent job they're doing, but also manage the expectations of, of students about what it, what it might look like and, and to uh, get, them, get them ready for that. Uh, we do think that it's likely to be a, a kind of a hybrid approach at, at, at some point, um, and, and there does offer some, some opportunities, but we are... I believe both still committed to campus-based education where students come in and, and, and meet one another. Um, you know, if it was all done uh, online, something would be lost in relation to that. So we do use the online as a tool to augment where we need to, but, but certainly uh, we remain committed to uh, campus-based education uh, because of the, 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 the special uh, advantages that that gives to learn in that way. Learning, after all, is a, is a social activity, and, and, that's, and that's why we have campuses. I guess I would also like to, to add to and reinforce the, the comments around um, McGee Medical School. It's absolutely critical that that gets signed off um, in, the, in the immediate future and would call on the Health Minister to move forward on that as a, as a matter of urgency to allow that intake to be, take place in the ne next academic year. Um, and I think that maybe as a committee that's something we, we should perhaps write to the, the three ministers with yeah. responsibilities on. Um, and it's not often that I, I will uh, put on a constituency hat and committee, but I do actually echo Claire's comments around the importance of securing um, a campus identity for the Colian campus as well. And, and I just uh, I would just like to reflect that too. And I, I know that I have discussed that with, with the Vice Chancellor um, previously as well. Um, uh, can I just ask a very quick final, um, or make a very quick final point, I suppose, around you have mentioned the, the efforts that have been put in by staff at universities to put in place the online resources um, and all of the, the extra work that is required with that, um, just around staff wellbeing and, and I suppose their mental health as well in terms of the additional um, burden with that and if that is how that is being addressed um, by the universities and, and uh, uh, working alongside the unions. Certainly um, that is, and that remains a, c a concern. We, our, our People and Culture uh, Directorate have been uh, really uh, hot on this, actually, but we're also um, learning on, on the job. Uh, we're asking people to do things now that we wouldn't have imagined doing. Uh, you yourselves will know um, the, the, the special demands of working on, on, online, where you go from one video conference to another. The cognitive intensity is really quite high. And just yesterday with the senior uh, team, we were having, having discussions about what does the new normal look like? What is our responsibilities uh, of an employer? We're beginning to think about, and we have worked with our unions. In fact, there was a communication that went out uh, just yesterday that we would want to enter into urgent discussions, which I think um, are happening um, tomorrow in relation to that. And we are just, we are just trying to, to, to ensure that our staff don't feel um, overburdened. When we pivoted to online, we encouraged the staff to take a bit of a pause 
to, to, to think about how they were going to do that and how they were going to transition. We didn't feel that uh, we, we didn't want people to feel that they would have to rush to put all their stuff online. That meant that we had to do things like um, push our exam boards back a little bit further to give the flexibility of staff to actually build uh, that provision, and we continue to hold that in review. But this is our uncharted territory uh, for, for, for us. Um, we, we also know that there are staff with children at home who are trying to be homeschooled at the same time. Um, there isn't really uh, an effective blanket response that you can do that other than give uh, messages of, of, of support and ensure that you're flexible enough to individ people's individual circumstances. So as an employer, we're trying to be as, as um, as, as focused on their welfare as possible, and after all, these are our these are our colleagues. They're our greatest asset. We need to continue to to, to, to support them. Um, but but we probably haven't got everything right so far. It, it's new territory, but we're absolutely committed to to um, easing this transition to online as as much as we possibly can. Okay, thank you very much to you both um, for your contributions this morning and um, we will follow up with the department in relation to the, the issues that have been highlighted. Um, if we are now moving on to our, our next um, agenda item which is matters arising um, but we are specifically um, dealing with the, the budget matters first and foremost um, and I think the officials are on the line. Yes, Chair. Um, Apologies we're, we're for the delay. Uh, that's, that's, that's okay. That's no problem at all. Can I just introduce ourselves first of all? Um, my, name is, my name is Colin. Uh, my name is Stephen McMurray. Um, I'm, um, my responsibility is uh, Deputy Secretary for Management Services and Regulation, which, in, which includes the finance function. So primarily over the last six weeks, my focus has been almost entirely in ensuring and maintaining the operational effectiveness of the department as we've moved from a, an in-work environment to a remote work environment, which has been quite a challenge. Um, but I understand that you wish to have various questions put to us in relation to budget and finance matters, which we will try to cover as best we can. We don't have a, an indication as to the number of questions that you'll ask us, but so we're really in your hands, Chair. Um, Peter, do you want to? Chair, if, if members have any questions they want to flag up, I have not got a list of members wanting to flag up questions, but I think Mr. O'Dowd. Yep. John, do you want to go ahead first then? Okay. I thought Colin would maybe give, give us uh, an overview. Uh, Colin, in terms of th this year's budget, I would assume, rightly or wrongly, that there has been a turn, downturn in certain business areas of the department, which will result in underspends, uh, because simply you can't deliver the programmes of work you would want to. Um, I note in the previous spring estimates that, for instance, Invest in I returned £27 million. Now, that may have been impacted by the global crisis, and there may be other reasons behind that, and you might want to give us some information on that. But certainly, are there savings being identified in the department? If so, how much? And are there plans to read directly, and particularly, and I asked the Minister about this earlier, in relation to the Student Hardship Fund? Okay, John, I'll talk a little bit about, I'll, I'll talk a little bit process there, but you've also raised a specific point in relation to provision in relation to Invest NI, which I'll ask Stephen to deal with, but I'll take your first, the general point first of all. Um, uh, the question is, is, is the right question in that um, clearly when budgets for this year were determined they were they were determined in the in the pre-covid environment um, obviously uh, the additional funding that has been provided subsequently uh, particularly with regard to the 10,000 pounds and 25,000 pounds grant claims and also additional funding that's set aside in the center which i think uh, amounts to something all of that amounts to about 410 million pounds is in, in in addition obviously to the original budgets so, I mean, when those budgets were determined, they were, I suppose, determined on the basis of business as usual. And the department and our arms length bodies will have business planned in, in that way. Clearly, those business plans are, are no longer fit for purpose and that they need to be recast. Um, the core department, and I'm, I'm responsible for, for corporate governance and business planning, 
is tomorrow uh, presenting a, a revised COVID-19 response business plan for the year to its departmental board for consideration, and then after that to the minister for her consideration. Um, that will that will demonstrate all of the all of the initiatives that we are now doing across the board, in addition to the major grant claims of which, the, and, and, and there are many initiatives that we are doing, but it will also reflect what we're not doing, what has been stopped. So um, we've also asked our major arms length bodies to do similar work, those, those arms length bodies who have a lot of discretionary spend. So we are talking about organisations such as Invest Northern Ireland, Tourism Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland Screen. I think, I think John, the expectation is that um, normal business, because it's, the economy is essentially shut down to a large extent, then, for example, if you would take Invest Northern Ireland, the, the, the expectation that its normal grant um, claims will simply not materialise, and there, and there will then be easements available, which will be determined in, in June monitoring. Um, we have asked those organisations to come to us within the next couple of weeks, in fact, the end of the first week in May, with revised business plans, exclusive of anything they want to do in relation to COVID so that we can determine how much money we might have uh, across the department to allow intra-departmental or indeed inter-departmental pressures relating to COVID to be met because we are conscious that, you know, while we have lots of things that aren't being met, other departments will have other things that have not been met. So we have started a process that will identify the scale of funding that might be available. And I am conscious, and you made this specific reference there to student hardship, that was one of the bids that we didn't get met um, by the centre in relation to um, our, our first salvo at getting uh, funding uh, because the focus was on the big grant schemes. I would anticipate that with easements coming in the department in the weeks to come, we would seek with the Minister's agreement to reallocate funding uh, along those lines. Okay, thank you. And in relation to Invest NI? Yes, I'll ask Stephen to deal, deal that issue, Stephen. Yes, Colin. Um, John, um, the £27 million, um, relates to a provision. That's a, a technical accounting issue with uh, Invest NI um, in terms of they have to account for grants um, as they are earned rather than as they are claimed. So those movements are treated through the provision. Um, at the start of the year, there would have been a similar movement in the provision. So in here, um, it all balances out to the resource budget that's allocated to them, uh, which is approximately 100 million resource. So that, that movement in provision is not real budget, if you like. Um, it's just a, a, an accounting treatment um, for them. And, and it isn't, you know, we didn't get 27 million back that we could use um, as a surrender. Um, the normal budget just goes through resource budget. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could just pick up on a question in relation to um, the the inescapable pre pressures, there is a 14 million that had been allocated to costs for EU exit, and I was just wondering what is that specifically um, for, and is there additional difficulties with that? preparation um, and perhaps additional resource required for that in light of the, the COVID-19 um, crisis as well? That's okay, Chair, I'll, I'll take this and then Stephen can, can come in behind, behind, behind me. I mean, uh, when we, when we uh, uh, were bidding for additional funding prior to the allocations, we identified what would be our inescapable pressures excluding EU exit funding and the inescapable pressures amounted to, to £32 million. Pounds. Now that covered a variety of things, broadly speaking actually um, salaries within the further education sector, city deals, energy, training for success and small other things. All of those were met. So we were fortunate enough to have our inescapable pressures met. The funding for EU exit, which was approximately 12 to 13 million, is in addition to that, and that will be dealt with separately. Um, I can't, I mean, you're talking to the wrong person here. My colleague, Paul Grocott, who's responsible for EU exit, could give you more detail in relation to the planning work that's going on in relation to that. And it's maybe something you want to follow up in the past. 
but my understanding is that funding will be met. The details of how it's spent, of course, is a matter for you to raise with my colleagues. Okay. No, I yes, and Colin, if I could just add, um, we bid for 14 million. Um, we got 12.3 million, and the minister is currently looking at that in terms of how that should be allocated. And in terms of just the, the capital um, pressures, um, is it envisaged that those works will, will continue this year? Um, well, our, our, capital, our capital pressures were met, so the allocation w w that we wanted, we got, essentially. Um, I suppose there's no... It's really hard to give you a precise answer to that. I mean, we are shut down at the present moment, Chair, so capital, capital construction works are, are, are not progressing. I mean, it, it really probably will be incumbent upon those starting up again to, to, to allow us to determine what the, 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 the liability this year will be. I mean, within the capital allocation, of course, we, also, we were given an, an allocation of £15 million for Project Stratum, which you'll be aware is the Rural Broadband Project. That um, uh, tendering process is nearing completion. In fact, um, the tendering process ends at the end of May. We will be progressing on the assumption that that will continue and the money will be spent. But again, that's, that is a big assumption at the present moment, and um, we just have to wait to see how um, we come out of this lockdown and how construction begins to kick in. No, no I think that's, that's understood by us all. Um, Sinead, did you have a question? Yeah, well, um, first of all, I think um, when you're trying to study this budget now, I find it very, very difficult to understand. I don't think it's transparent at all. And we are sitting here, um, you know, two or three, four or five working days off from going into to the Assembly to discuss the budget. And I'm just not too sure if when you're saying that a revised COVID-19 budget is going to be, um, uh, <coughs> going to be uh, delivered tomorrow. I, I just don't even see the point in talking about all of this because it doesn't, there's no clarity in it. There's no transparency in it. And as a scrutinizer and within here, the, 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 the economy committee, I can't, I can't see anything that, I could be comfortable with at this particular time because I don't know even if you have modelled the current um, the current economic crisis and I don't think you've modelled the, the Brexit crisis and how we would actually divide out spending uh, based on the fact that we haven't done our homework just defies belief to be honest. So that that that's that's just my um, little gripe today. Maybe I have sorry, a sorry, I don't, I, I, sorry, I mean, I don't have any video here, so I'm not sure who, who, who asked the question. This is Sinead McLaughlin. Well, Sinead, I simply disagree with you entirely. I mean, what, what you have is a, is a budget which was determined pre-COVID. This department has been working very hard over the last couple of weeks to revise and produce a new business plan reflecting how we are dealing with COVID and how we're continuing business as usual. We can't do it any quicker than this. Um, I, can, I can understand that, but going forward, how are we meant to actually plan out a budget based on something that is evolving moment by moment? I mean, you're, you're actually saying that the, the revised COVID-19 budget is coming forward tomorrow. And how are we, are we today meant to scrutinise something that is not coming out until tomorrow? No, I, no, listen, I mean, we were asked to come along to answer questions on budget, which we were doing. I'm telling you of the process that, that my department is doing. It has reacted quickly to COVID to, to revise its own business plan. Mm -hmm. That plan has, is a detailed plan with many, many initiatives uh, to deal with the COVID. It has to be approved and presented to our minister, you, you know, and that's what we're doing. The intention would be, I would suggest, that once the ministers approve it, would then share it with, 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 with yourselves. And therefore, we, then you could subject us to the necessary scrutiny. But we do need a few weeks to be able to completely revise how we are addressing what is an unprecedented position. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll see when it um, delivers or when it comes to our table. Because I, I, I don't see it. I don't see any clarity or I don't see any transparency in what I, in the papers that I've got at the moment. But, Chair, but, 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 but Mr. McLaughlin, you wouldn't have a copy of our plan until it's been assessed in here. We have been working the last three weeks to produce this. You will get it when the minister has looked at it, is content with it, and then it'll be subject to whatever scrutiny you wish to, to, to put to officials. Okay, thank you. Chair, it might be at this point useful for me to clarify um, 
that I'm aware the budget process will have to change in, res in, in response to this. Um, and the template that we asked the department to fill in, which was across all departments, um, was initially predicated on a normal budget process. Um, there's a heavy caveat at the end of it that indicates this is where we are now, but it might not be where we are in the, in the very near future. Um, and I think, Chair, the committee's discussion by video call on Monday about reflecting that issue in the budget debate on Monday, sorry, Tuesday, will be the same across all departments, particularly a department like economy, where it has the most significant, um, one of the most significant COVID-19 responses. The, the template did indicate a lot of um, requests for funding related to COVID-19, and as officials have indicated, um, that's all still very much up in the air. It's almost the irony of, we, we can't move to that until we've moved to the pre-COVID-19 budget and then we can redo the budget. Um, if that's, that's probably a very clumsy way to explain it, but it, it is a very, very awkward situation. Mm -hmm. uh, John, you want it back in? Yeah, I had mentioned in the, in the committee a few weeks ago that we need to rip up the rule book in terms of how we manage economies and how we do things. And uh, I think in this stage, I, I'm happy to give officials a bit of flexibility in some of this stuff because it is an ever-evolving situation uh, moving forward. But, uh, so just to clarify then, Colin, in relation to the revisions that are going on, it's to the board, the departmental board tomorrow, and then on to your minister, and then the committee will receive a copy of that when the minister has signed off on it? That's correct, John, yes. Okay. Can I just ask you another question in relation to the financial transactions capital? which has proven difficult uh, to spend down through the years. I think that's maybe as much to do with Treasury as it is to do with our local departments in fairness. Is the, the Department of the Economy looking at this as a way forward or innovative ways of spending this capital in, in terms of economic recovery moving forward? Um, um, well, I think, I think you make the point that it's, it's, it's not something that's, um, I suppose, limited to, to this department. I think all departments ha have been grappling for some time how best to use that, that financial instrument. And I would suggest it perhaps hasn't been using it as well and as efficiently as it, it can do. I, I honestly think, John, nothing is, I mean, you made this point, every, everything is on the table here. We are going to require every last um, pound uh, uh, and when we think about how we're going to move from recovery into rebuild, and I've absolutely no doubt that there will be uh, an emphasis on uh, infrastructural spend um, and on other forms of capital expenditure. Whatever jam pot it comes from, to be frank, I don't care, as long as the money is used. And I think us and, uh, and certainly the Department of Finance are attuned to that fact that we have to look creatively to use every single amount of uh, uh, money that we have to help rebuild the economy going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you both for, for joining us and for the, the update. And, um, and I agree with John that there is obviously an awful lot of work that's going on um, to, to update um, the, the budget and the, the, the work plans that the, the department had. And we, we do look forward to getting those. Um, I think Gordon wants to come in yeah. for a question. Yes, thanks very much, gentlemen. And uh, we appreciate the efforts that you've been working on under extreme pressure and, and very difficult times. Um, you're obviously very aware, and you've probably listened in to the concerns of members uh, on relation to the grants. And I think we still need to see that there's uh, more of an input there into the, the grant schemes. We understand there's about two more coming on. And I suppose the, the frank question is, is there much money left in the pot to, to meet all these requirements? And what more can be done to try and find more resources to meet the, the ongoing demands of business out there for financial support this time? That's my first point. The second one I think you've already mentioned somewhat is moving forward, we're going to need significant resources in Invest NI to sustain our existing businesses and to build uh, on our exports. And of course, we need additional funding for tourism, which we've all talked about here extensively, the significant impact that there has been on tourism, probably which will run throughout this calendar year. So those couple of points, I think, need to be stressed. 
that going forward into the new financial year, we're going to have to concentrate more funding towards both of those sections? Um, Gordon, there's a, a couple of points there, and and I mean, I will I will give you my views. Um, obviously, these issues are are will be for ministers and the executive to decide. Um, would we like would we like more funding? I think of of, of course, and I'm, and I'm quite sure all ministers will be making a strong business case for financial support, and, and legitimately so. Um, I, I, you know, I think this is a, a resource allocation problem like like no other. Um, get it wrong, and the local economy could be severely damaged for many years to come. Um, we have been, I mean, this department has all clearly been allocated a large proportion of the Barnet Consequential. Um, you'll be aware, obviously, of the £370 million pounds that has been earmarked for the, the £10,000 and £25,000 grant scheme. Yeah. And I, I, am, I, am, I am acutely aware through talking to my, my policy colleagues and the minister as to the, the concern that's out there in terms of businesses that might fall through the cracks or um, various other issues. And so it's a, it's a major issue. Um, naturally, you bring more companies into the mix, you require more money. Um, there's also issues with regard to calling for an additional hardship fund, which I'm sure the minister referred to. That will, that's earmarked for us, and it's in, still being held in the centre. That's another £40 million. Pounds. But if we want to, it, it, I mean, we can spend money, but of course, it, this will be an issue for the executive to determine what is the, 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 the priorities. Um, and we will be making a strong case. As I said to question, uh, answered to question to John early, earlier, we were, not be able, we were not be able to support, for example, um, up to this point, these student hardship issues. But there is a, they are as legitimate as some of the claims for businesses as well. So what we have to do, and I think I, I tried to give some assurance to John earlier on, is that when we look at um, uh, June monitoring, which we'll be starting fairly certainly to work on, we have to determine whether there are easements across the department that we could better use to address COVID-related issues. That may well include, to address your point, um, um, requirements from the Invest in iClan companies. But I think we need, I think, Gordon, to understand the full extent of those and take an informed view as to where the best impact is going to be made. It may not necessarily be in business support. It may well be in other things like student hardship. We just need to understand the scale of the issues that we have to deal with and then make informed um, uh, options to the minister to allow decisions to be taken. Okay, thanks very much, Colin and Stephen. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you to you both, and, and I'm sure we'll have you back soon. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, thank you. you. So we're going to move straight on now to item numbers eight and nine on the, the agenda, which is the legislation that we have to deal with. And there's the two SRs, um, the Working Time Coronavirus Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and then SR 2020-70, the statutory paternity pay, statutory adoption pay and statutory shared parents pay, normal weekly earnings, etc. Coronavirus Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Sorry, what page? when you do the two at once, Chair. Really what page are you on there, sir? Don't, I'm going to um, tell you now. Yeah. Um, it's page 141 is the clerk's memo for the first SR, um, and then the SR itself is at page 143. The SL1 then is at page 150. Um, the clerk's memo for the second SR is then page 154, the SR is at page 156 and the SL1 is at page 165. Um, members will be aware that the committee has received both the SL1 and SLR for both legislation in parallel for today's meeting. Both rules are subject to negative re resolution. SR68, which is the working time regulations, um, one came into operation on the 24th of April and this, this second one, SR202070, um, came into effect on the 25th of April. The Minister has stated her regret that the protocol around the 21-day rule has not been followed in this instance, but states that the rules form part of the Department's COVID-19 emergency response, with SR 68 key to protected employment rights, and SR 70 ensuring that working parents are not disadvantaged by the fact that they have been put on furlough during the relevant assessment period for the statutory payments covered. 
Um, SR 68 amends the working time regulations to ensure workers for whom it is not practically possible to take holidays during the COVID-19 situation can carry some of their holiday entitlement over into the following two leave years. It is hoped that by allowing workers to carry over their leave into two rather than one, the same pressures on businesses is avoided by the leave being able to be spread over a wider time frame. And then with SR 70, it addresses the issue where an employee is receiving 80% of their usual earnings because they've been furloughed under the coronavirus job retention scheme. The original 100% figure is used for calculating their normal weekly earnings in regards to, to, to statutory paternity adoption and shared parents' pay. The examiner of statutory rules has not been able to report on the rules yet, and so members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the, the, the examiner of statutory rules report. Um, and members had discussed these in our informal call on Monday. Um, we had discussed some concerns around SR 68, um, some private business owners who have been in contact with members um, currently have um, around uh, a perceived enforcement onto private businesses. Holiday arrangements would be more widely held within the public sector and the negative impact that this could have. Um, on particular businesses. Obviously, with it being extended over two years, um, that, that mitigates that to an extent. And obviously, it's key that, that we um, do protect the, the rights of, of the workers and employees in all of this as well, um, while we're mindful of the impact that it will have on businesses. Um, so if members are consent with the SRs, or have anyone any um, additional points that they want to make around it? Sure, just it, it now becomes I suppose, a legal requirement then on uh, the private employers to allow this, would that be fair? Once the SR has yeah. passed, yeah. 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 Um, the legal requirement. It, it's, it's one of those situations where it has to apply across the piece. Yeah. Um, but as discussed on Monday, yeah. ultimately there will have to be some level of mitigation looked at for this if needed. Um, and employers may find that they will be able to avail of um, buying out leave or those other um, kinds of mitigations that there may well be. And ultimately, like so many things that the committee have already talked about this morning, this is for now. Mm -hmm. um, we, we may well have to look at how it gets managed further down the line, but it's just that um, issue of people can't take leave at this moment in time because they're on furlough and for other reasons, so they need protection that it's not just automatically lost. Whereas when we emerge from the other side of this, it may well be problematic as members have already flagged up and they may have to think again. So in terms of that, the caveat that I would seek members' support for is that if the committee is content to provisionally agree this um, subject to the examiner statutory rules report, that there's a caveat that it's revisited mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of the crisis because there will need management of this. There will need to be management of this. Um, because there clearly are going to be issues. Um, but at this moment in time, it's necessary for the protection yeah. of those workers who have been furloughed in other circumstances. It runs over two leave years. So it allows two years for the leave to be managed. Yeah. Um, I think that was as, as obviously a, a, a way of trying to make it as um, spreading user friendly and spread it over as long as yeah. possible. Yeah. Generally, you right. wouldn't try and look more than two years. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. So, members are content. I'll put the questions on the on the two SRs. Um, that the committee for the economy has considered SR twenty twenty sixty eight, the working time coronavirus amendment regulations, Northern Ireland twenty twenty, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Members content. Agreed. Agreed. Um, that the committee for the economy has considered SR twenty twenty seventy, the statutory paternity pay statutory adoption pay and statutory shared parents pay, normal weekly earnings, etc., coronavirus amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Thank you, members. Content. Okay. Um, item number 10, then, on the agenda it was the latest examiner of statutory rules um, report. It's at page 169 of your pack. Are members content to note? Great. Yes. Chair, I'm wondering, uh, I appreciate members are now under pressure of time. If members are content, Chair, and you're um, content, we can um, put correspondence, roll it forward, either into next week's meeting, or if there's a, an urgent pressure of time, we can do an um, agreement by correspondence pack. Are members content to do that? Yeah. Yes. Great. Yeah. Thank you, members. Thank you, Claire. <coughs> 
she's there. So she, there's time. Thank you, too. <laughs> I keep meeting you. <laughs> So um, the forward work pack is item number 12 and it's at page 234. Do we want to agree that now? Jeff, if, if members are content, we've um, scheduled up till the end of February. The caveat on that is we also... May, end of May. Sorry, well, what did I say February? <laughs> May, May, May. Um, where am I? It's just <laughs> stopped. It's, no, it's, it's <laughs> scary there. It's got to me in the end. Um, so we have, it, we have it up till the end of May, but the, the heavy caveat on that is obviously we'd be rescheduling in the Minister on subsequent budget. So it's a very, very wide um, kind of bid for these are the organisations that we're, we're kind of bringing in first. So if members are content uh, with that caveat, we proceed. Great. Thank you. Um, are we doing item number 13 then? The Lost me. Committee previously discussed the work of the Tourism and Recovery Steering Group and the LRA. Yeah, if we just very quickly before the Deputy Chair leaves, if members are content to agree the two letters um, around seeking input into the LRA Forum and the Tourism Recovery Steering Group, if members are content? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then item number 14 is the date, time and place of next meeting, which is um, room 30 next Wednesday morning. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.